Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to this session this morning. This is our, the way it looks for us now, but it, over the years it has looked in many different ways for us. And so the movie I heard was very much of a hush after the movie, so you've had a whole night to percolate on what was shared with the movie. And we had had some questions too about um, what was your question about the, the monastery or what we have going on in Utah? Because we actually have uh, a community in Mexico, we have a community in Utah, and we have a community in Spain on the island of Mallorca in the Mediterranean. And over the years we've, we've had devotional stays. Uh, Mike came down to Mexico, was that for about a month, a few month, weeks? A month of June, yeah. Month of June. Two months ago, two months ago. Yeah, two or three months ago he came. So we have these devotional stays sometimes where people come two, three, four weeks, or sometimes it extends a little bit longer to just kind of live in community and practice the mind training with the support of, of a very devoted community that stays focused on the purpose of, of forgiveness with every every moment of the day. So there's a lot of uh, projects and collaborations. We actually, uh, the four of us went to see a, uh, a movie last night called Overcomer. And it was a Christian movie, but it was a, a beautiful message and it was uh, uh, kind of a, left us with a warm feeling as we left the cinema. We were just guided, it was down in Del Mar, pretty close here. but. Over the years, we have done things from traveling around the world, um, doing gatherings, moving gatherings, retreats. I think the longest retreats that I've done has been over in Spain. I've done six-week retreats. So people go with me into metaphysical <laughs> movies and deep experiences, but their consciousness has sometimes changed. After six weeks, they, they kind of approach the final few days like, I have no idea what I'm going back to. My whole perception of the world has yeah. has flipped <laughs> so much that I don't even know how I'm going to plug back in <laughs> to what I used to call my life. Mm -hmm. And so they typically will stay together in Facebook groups and vibrationally stay very connected, almost like a little awakening pod who've gone through so many experiences together that that they have emotions coming up and they just rely on each other as mighty mates, as mighty companions um, because the vibrationally they go through so much. I remember one of those six week retreats where I was with them and I, I was going to Barcelona from the island of Mallorca to do a few days of gatherings and and they were saying, well what what do we do? What do we have to pray? What is it going to take? And I said, well, I, I don't know, if you really want to go through an acceleration, maybe you just pray to the Holy Spirit, bring it on. I said, when you pray to the Holy Spirit, bring it on. Uh, just be ready for what is to come. And I said, is anybody here uh, feel, feeling that? And then one by one, it was like that, that uh, Robin Williams movie, Captain My Captain, they, they were like, Fists are going up in the air, bring it on! <laughs> Very brave, bring it on! And then there was like 14, 15 people in the room, all at the top of their lungs, Holy Spirit, bring it on! And yeah, those last couple weeks, uh, that was a very direct prayer and a lot of unconscious uh, got cleared because of the, the prayer of the heart. It was just such a, des a strong desire. But for example, those six week retreats, people come from all over the world and then there's lots of metaphysical movies, usually one every night, and working together in the kitchen, collaborating on projects together, mm -hmm. it's just so focused and devotional and concentrated in those six weeks. So it's not like they're, they're going to a monastery to give their life over maybe decades, but they're giving like a concentrated six weeks to really immerse and to go for an experience and to allow the darkness to come up in a, in a safe, integral, uh, very secure environment where people feel like they can, they can do that. And occasionally we have had uh, some very strange experiences 
one time I was doing one of those retreats and a man kind of came to the session dressed in a black hood and went into some kind of a chant right in front of me <laughs> for uh, for quite a, for a while until we finally just had to pause because it was so distracting uh, for the other participants <laughs> they didn't know <laughs> what was going on <laughs> but we've had some things over the years but I think it's because we have such a strong desire for healing that the spirits always there with us and if always we're gently guided in what's practical to say and do in any situation to allow for this movement of the darkness to move through to come to this uh, very free, open state of mind where it's very joyful and there's much laughter and it, Susanna was, we were looking today, there was like a three year uh, Facebook memory of uh, from Holland and uh, that was a five day retreat where we went there and um, basically people were about 57 people and people were very intellectual and kind of a bit closed at the beginning. So after a couple, two or three days, the Jesus guided me to show uh, two different movies. Some of you may have seen one of the movies is pretty Joaquin Phoenix and Her, Her mm -hmm. uh, which is a very, very powerful movie. And then we showed a Korean movie called The Beauty Inside. Inside. And that was a, that's like a can opener. And then whoosh, everybody just all their emotions came up after those two movies. They were like Rotor Rooter movies. <laughs> so whatever closed down feelings they were, they were wide open. And then the sessions became very interactive and very expressive. And the emotions were flowing then. The, the channel was open. And then I remember the final day we went out to the woods and People, we were in a big closing circle and then people started holding hands and like little three-year-olds running, uh, holding hands, running through the woods in glee. Like they were just little children who had been just let out of uh, preschool. And they were just so happy and singing and eye-gazing. And so ultimately, that was just that was like a five-day, uh, you know, Susanna's life has never... <laughs> Never been, the same. Never been the same since then. <laughs> it's a picture on Facebook of us laughing together at that retreat. But these are very, very impactful because I, it's just because the devotion to, to authentic awakening is so strong and then it just reflects, it radiates out and everything that we perceive, everything that the light touches, you know, lights up. And so today we, we're letting you know we we, we are kind of always in flux in the sense that our monastery, our Course in Miracles monastery, that was the backdrop for the movie, uh, it's open generally for three seasons. Occasionally we, we do have uh, sauna retreats during the winter in the snow. But um, we pretty much are just guided by spirit in terms of what to offer and we just don't know, we're, we're kind of a, becoming a very much of a mystical community like the, like the Essenes and, and the Apostles and the Franciscans where we just are guided by prayer and we have had, uh, as Mike was at the devotional stay down in Mexico, we have, have had those down there, we have had devotional stays over in, uh, in Spain and I feel we probably will be doing retreats because there's a very strong call in Europe and it's a nice, people like to leave the cold northern uh, countries to come to the warm, sunny Mallorca and that's where the, the center is located. But things come to us um, fairly swiftly, things just drop in and then we put it out, we put the invitation out, just like we did with, with this gathering. It was it took three weeks. <coughs> three three weeks. weeks ago, I got a phone call. Would you be open to doing this? We said yes. And, you know, we were sold out in the weekend. <laughs> so, yeah. Full house. Yeah, it's nice. We like that. Very <laughs> spontaneous. Mm -hmm. So, today is your chance to, having seen the movie and having had a bit of an experience of what we've talked about in setting the movie up, just to ask any questions, they can be logistical questions about connecting in with us, 
uh, questions about where do we do that, um, how do we do that. We do have, I think, on our livingmiracles.org uh, website, we have a, it's called a devotional stay application, and then people just fill out an application, and then usually uh, once it becomes aware in our minds through prayer, in one of our centers where it's, it's time to open it up for maybe a devotional stay, then people will come, what is it, for two weeks, four two weeks? weeks? Minimum. Two weeks minimum um, to come to a devotional stay. And usually it's like two to four weeks in, in most cases. And then that can extend on if it just feels like it's really a deep experience. And so that just gives you a little bit of a context. So we're not, we're not like a cloistered community. We do feel like we're going into like a very mystical phase for us, but it's not like a cloistered sense of, you know, where people can't contact us or can't participate with us. And we do, I have enjoyed traveling around the world many times and, and just meeting all the lovely people around the world that we visit and just share with. And so that's, for me, that's been very dear too. I think all of us, Francis has been quite the world traveler and then uh, I know Susanna and Jeffrey love, love to travel and love to just, there we are doing a movie workshop where you can just ask them questions because uh, they they were played a very prominent part in the, the movie in the mystery school and are here to talk about it <laughs> so. I have a question about roles so it was Susanna the cook who Francis, Francis the cook oh, sorry, Francis the cook sorry I'm getting confused but Francis the cook and there was another gal that came in Jen Jen and there was the gal that seemed to be kind of the mother hen, Lisa? Is it the name Lisa? <laughs> right, and she was talking to, Francis. sorry. Francis Fran Ramirez. Francis, mm -hmm. right, and saying that the, what I got was, you're here to cooperate, learn to cooperate. And Mike and I were talking about this morning, and you no, know, that's, that's really not why the, I'm not communicating this well. It's kind of a confused question. So what I thought was that she was a really skilled cook at organizing, managing, and kind of doing her kitchen, right? Someone else comes in, not familiar with cooking, she can make a salad. So now she is in charge of the kitchen. So I didn't quite get what the purpose of that was. Could you talk to that? I know it's about the undoing, but there was a little bit something confusing about that for me, and I'd like to correct I can start, yeah. Well, the thing is, um, you know those those um, things. The role was given. The role was taken. It was all based on a prayer of, you know, what is going on. So nobody truly have this particular intention to say, this is your undoing. So we're gonna do this particular thing to undo. But it's it's the spirit. So the prayer was sent, and at that point, I remember Francis was. Um, cooking three meals a day was completely overwhelmed and um, a little bit of the background was also that she had been coming to the monastery for almost 10 years whenever there is a retreat she came to cook in exchange for her time to be part of the mm -hmm. retreat because she was always on scholarship and, I, and then um, that happened but later on, when I was watching the footage, I realized she had leg pain. She didn't, she couldn't stand for too long, which we, when that whole thing happened, nobody particularly had a bigger picture, but she had leg pain. She was in pain. She was in prayer about letting go of the self-concept of being a cook because that self-concept also come with tremendous amount of responsibility and imprison her to believe that she, this is the only way she can receive love. If she doesn't cook, she cook for her family, she cook for old for friends, this is the only way she can receive love. You know, she was like a professional baker. She was a professional. Smith's, which is a she huge She had her own restaurant. Yeah. And that was her life for decades. She was the cook for absolutely everybody. And, and yet that role was so tight 
that this is the only reason she believes she's worthy. Mm-hmm. And and then the physical pain, the the going through the motion, there was no joy anymore. And then this girl Jane came, this this huge spark, no skill, but there was an inspiration. So when when things are happening in the monastery, it was so much we is very much tuned into what is inspired and what is guided, because the spirit is doing its work in the inspiration, not so much doing going through the motion, just get things done. So that's that's the you know seemingly what's going on, but of course spirit always does it for much much deeper reason. When I watched the footage way back, uh, when I was editing, I found out she prayed. I want to let go of this self-concept of being a cook. I've had enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, And I think if you look at the Course, I can kind of give, a, that's the shorter perspective. The broader perspective is that the Course is all about forgiveness so we can recognize our oneness, that we're all the same one, we're all the same Christ, we're all the same Spirit, we're all the same love. And there's many passages in the Course that point to in terms of human experience, because everything has to be brought down to human experience, we have to be able to relate to our practice. If if we're if the ideas are up here and we, we can't, they aren't even relevant to us. Then how are we going to use them? We have to like even though the the course says the time isn't real, then it's got 365 lessons, one for every day of a calendar year. For a course that's teaching ultimately, spirit is eternal. But you see how practical that is. So the course is basically, I tell people, is, is the one lesson that I mentioned in the movie was perfect equality. We're, we're just here to see we're perfectly equal. Mm-hmm. Regardless of age and gender, culture, regardless of years of study, or as they say in Zen, beginner's mind, you know, sometimes the, some of the most vast experiences when you, you, ha- you know nothing about something and then everything just flow so glorious and a lot of Zen teachers will say, ah yes, beginner's mind, it's wonderful. And so when we talk about leadership roles and follower roles, which is really related to your question, because yes. here's, here's someone coming in who's, who's coming in with a prayer on her heart, Jen's there, how can I be truly helpful and so forth. But to the world it can be s- kind of strange. I mean you don't invite somebody who's been hired on day one to be the CEO of the company, uh, from a worldly perspective that would be crazy. But what we have found is when we pray and we <coughs> receive guidance that the Spirit will, will use even roles like leader follower to loosen the mind from the pride of thinking it knows what it is. And, and in this case with Frances Romero she was very very deeply steeped and identified with cooking, Baking is the way I offer love and I receive love. And it was a self-concept identity that was tied into the cooking. And with Jen, you know, she says, well, I did a, you know, a salad once for a potluck. You know, you can tell <laughs> she is. And, and when I think of salad, I don't think croutons, you know, and you know, she's, she's not in that place. But the Spirit guided us in that way because in many ways, in relationships and in different retreats and whatever, these kind of leader follower roles help loosen the mind up and then there can be a breakthrough and in, in the movie they ended up like hugging and, and, and coming to a place of, oh, we're, we're together, we're in this together. Now ultimately this is just a preliminary step towards where the Course is going though. Because the Course is going to a place where Jesus actually says that both the leader role and the follower role are egoic that ultimately these are egoic constructs yes. and the spirit can, has to use what the ego made so it's never about trying to assume a role and thinking that the, your happiness or your salvation lies in that role these temporary roles are more used and juxtaposed even with A Course in Miracles it's a classic example because Helen Schuckman uh, we're told in larger context had this amazing scribal ability that she had developed over many lifetimes to tune in to spirit that way but in a previous lifetime she had misused the scribal ability as a priestess 
And in fact, her collaborator in this lifetime with the Corps, Bill Thetford, she had even had him killed. Uh, they had been they had spent many lifetimes together, and she had actually had him killed uh, in one of the lifetimes. And here they are brought together, and he's more the comforter. He's very steady, uh, very calming, and, and and we were kind of giving names to the. Helen was the scribe. Bill was like the support. the support, the comfort. Uh, Ken was the teacher, and uh, Judy. Judy was like the public publisher and the networker. So they all had very specific roles. But with Helen and Bill, Bill was had hired her in 1958 to Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. So he was the boss, and yet she had this powerful mind, very sharp, sharp-witted very, very bright, and with this tremendous scribal ability, which she had misused, and now she was brought in a little before the, the ability, it's almost like she wasn't quite baked yet, but, <laughs> but Jesus said people are being called in from all over to accept their part in a celestial speed up, like the world condition is worsening to such an extent that people are being called from all over, so Helen was, you might say, great psychic ability, great scribe, uh, not quite graduated yet. It's going to be a bumpy ride, and it was. It was. She had huge resistance because Jesus told her because of the guilt of the misuse of the ability in the past. We're reading Carol Howe's book, Never Forget Remember, to Laugh, yeah. and one of the things that we love about that is that here are two people. They're at it all the time, except when they're in these scribing situations. Um, he's a gay man. She's married. She has this massive attachment and crush on him. And you think, well, you think I'm having problems with the course. Here are these people that are just really not in tune with, at least not yet, with um, the teachings. And, you know, they are as messed up as any of us. And they're messed up in their relationship. Well, one of the things that one of the passages that I love so much is he's describing, Carol's describing how when um, Helen is taking taking dictation, Bill and she had an agreement that she would not reread what she had written and that they would do that together. And he would be typing and she would be reading what she had scribed in shorthand. And the description was that he would type with one hand and hold her hand because she was sobbing as she read this. She was so scared and so flipped out. And for, for them to have such a cantankerous, ornery relationship in one setting and such a loving, kind, supportive, exceptional relationship on the other just put me into, just into tears. Yeah. So anyway, I wanted yeah. to share that because it gave me, me hope. Yeah, and that's the, really the broader context. Like when we pray together during a mystery school, for example, we'll just pray together, and um, somebody who's aware of what's going on in the kitchen, it's intense. Um, Francis is is overwhelmed. Francis Romero is overwhelmed. She has a, a, a sore leg. She's had trouble. And we just pray. We listen to everything, and then we pray. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, help is needed, and then what? who should be the one? Who do we have available? So it's all through prayer, but you can see, just like with Helen and Bill, the, the, it's all to help us learn to collaborate, because miracles yes. are a collaborative venture. Yes. So it's not so much cooperate in the sense that sometimes cooperation, uh, it's almost like, well, I, I don't want to do this, I have a grievance, but I'm going to try to cooperate, you know, to, to do what, what someone wants me to do. But this is more like a prayerful collaboration of like listening to what would be most helpful. And oftentimes that, that is not known under the surface, even of the people that are participating in it. They, they're just trusting that that prayerful guidance is, is really there. So here's a follow-on question. What's the difference between that and no people-pleasing? So here are their uh, role reversals, right? People-pleasing, in my understanding, is going about doing something so not to rock the boat. Not about verbalizing your request, not about articulating where you are, 
but just kind of going along resentfully. So if you could talk to that, that would be really helpful because Mike and I are always talking about, you know, no people pleasing. And we're in this discussion about, well, what does that really mean? Because I'll make a request and I don't consider that people pleasing because I'm really articulating, well, this is my position, this is how I feel about it, and would you be willing to do X? And sometimes he is and sometimes he isn't. But the question is, if, if he says, yes, I'm willing to do that, for me, not for him, is that people pleasing? I think it, you could see in the movie that, that even after they were both put in the same kitchen, um, the people pleasing was so thick that later on, uh, Frances Romero, when she was talking to Lisa, was like saying, well, I just wanted to, you know, show you guys. And she said, Jen, no, show you guys. Like, you put her in there, now you see what you've done. You face the consequences of that. It was more like, I'll show you guys. And then with, with Jen, it was more, you know, she went in there with a spark. Okay, I'm, I'm heading the kitchen up now, and, and I'll just give it my best shot. But she started to shut down. Um, when the eye contact wasn't there, when there was active resistance and so forth. So those are like the symbols of the people pleasing. Uh, it runs very deep. We were just talking to Bob Rosenthal and his wife and he was saying even though the Course doesn't mention people pleasing per se in that kind of wording, it's very much about non-compromise. In fact, there's a, a, a line in the Course that says salvation is no compromise of any kind. Reminds me of the Bible, remember? Let your yea be yea, and let your nay be nay. That takes a lot of mind training. As we, as we move through a day, whatever our roles seem to be, in business, family roles, relationship roles, that really what people pleasing about the core essence is, when we feel that we can't, we, we don't really want to follow this guidance, but we want to do something that seems like it's easier to just give in, it's easier to just do it for the sake of doing it, to, to not provoke a response, and so on and so forth, you know, to try to take the smooth way, oftentimes it's smooth way defined based on past learning. I'll just avoid the person. I, w I just won't say it, even though it's what I'm thinking. I keep hearing it in my mind, say this, say this, and then the ego's like, are you crazy? You want to rock the boat? You could get pitched out of the house if you say this. Whereas, you notice, Jesus was a great model of let your yes be yes and no be no. He was so clear in his teachings as the Holy Spirit was coming through him that, that there were a lot of people that seemed to be very upset. Um, even in his own biological family when he started to, the Urantia book tells us, when he started to really step into his function as the Christ, as the I Am Presence, before Abraham was I Am, that his biological family, Mary and his biological family, were, were kind of reacting like, he's, he's beside himself, like he's going off the deep end now, you know, he's talking out there like he's at eternity speaking. And, and then when he went back to Nazareth, where he was raised, the, there were no miracles, the Bible says, because the people there, they knew Jesus as a little boy growing up, and don't give me this Messiah business, and I don't know, this stuff about being the savior of the world is hard. I mean, I watched him grow up, I watched him fall in the dirt and the mud, and now he's Messiah of the whole universe, you know. Because of their past association, there were no miracles, because they didn't have the spaciousness to really appreciate that presence. So the people-pleasing is all based on past associations and, and healing is the undoing of these false associations <coughs> and coming into true guidance. And oftentimes the guidance will, will not, like the scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' time, they were very much bent on the, the Judeo, the Torah and the Judeo uh, culture. And when, when any time calling him Messiah, or, you know, when he would speak things, uh, like before Abraham was, I am, that was particularly react, reacted to by the rabbis and the Sanhedrin and everything, because they're like, oh, come on, before Abraham, our whole tradition and laws are based on the teachings of Abraham, and now you're coming and saying, 
that you're prior to Abraham. You know, that was like blasphemy. And then when he would heal on the Sabbath, you're not, that was against the rules. You know, you could heal on other days, but the Sabbath is a rest day. This is Labor Day right here. <laughs> and we had to wave off the, the weed whackers and everything. And they were showing up on Labor Day to, to do all the work here. We had to say, oh, talk to your boss. Maybe. Take, so, a take a day off, you know. It's, we're broadcasting to the whole universe today. We're <laughs> and, and recording. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, but you can see where it's the undoing of customs, of norms, of a lot of cultural beliefs, and that's the purpose of the guidance, is to undo everything and leave you as the Christ, as the, the Christ that we all share, the presence of love that we, we all really are. So that's kind of a context for it in the movie. And I think, um, yeah, there, in the movie there are many moments where you can tell people are not people-pleasing, you know, when, when they're in other relationships, it's pretty direct conversations when suddenly you feel something, even in a relationship, then you can, you're able to share your thoughts. You don't know where it leads. You don't need to hide it. You don't need to say, you know, our goal is to, is this form goal or that form goal, but just share the thoughts. And a lot of the times, we, we find, we realize if we truly share our inspiration, our thoughts, we really don't know where the chip's gonna fall because there's no box. And it's much bigger collaboration, much bigger solution than, than our box can contain. So even with mother-daughter relationship, because I feel very close to, to that myself, you know, being on this journey and and then uh, facing the family dynamic, and my, my mom would come to say, you know, who are you talking to? I'm your mother, and, and just like, there's like a, a role that's still trying to play with each other, and not able to, to let ourselves completely outgrow from a role, and to extend to a bigger love, and agape love toward each other, but with Susanna, I see this is this is the hope when you dare to say, okay, I don't know how to relate in the same way, and then the other one comes to say, let's let go of the old. Boom, then we meet there. This is the solution you, you, you know, we don't have as a human condition. Just So this feels like this is the solution when we dare to, to speak, and we, if we are in contradiction, then let's just pray. Even when we were in uh, Bob Rosenthal's house, his wife, the, the president of a Foundation for Inner Peace, he, she was saying, you know, this is the way the, the, the whole foundation they were doing with publishing the course, translating all these personality clashes and different opinions. But, but then they say, okay, then we have to pray. The moment they come together to pray, no matter who said what before that moment, when they come to that space, they always hear the same thing. So that's, yeah, that's the it's solution. A, that's the, the prayer is, is in place of a business plan because the Foundation for Inner Peace, even though they published the course and are quite a large organization worldwide, they, they have no business plan. They just pray to the Holy Spirit with every single decision and have done that for the last four <coughs> decades. And I said, oh, that's what we do too. How it plays out, in, in interpersonal relationships though, like Francis and I, we went through a phase where we were traveling around the world. It was like global <coughs> travels in many, many countries. And I remember after we had just completed a trip all the way around the country, we were I think at a, at a hotel in China, maybe in uh, Beijing or Shanghai. And we were just praying and uh, we both kind of opened our eyes and it's like, are you hearing what I'm hearing? We had just completed a worldwide trip and it was like, 360 around the world here we go again and we both looked at each other and she got on her phone and computer and booked the flights all the way here to there around the world and it, it was like a download we both heard it we felt it she got right on it and then that day by the by the end of that day she had completed booking flights connecting flights and flights all around and then we just jumped right into 
yet another world tour, completely 360 around the world. Now, also, we were so devoted to spirit that like when we went to, to China, and it was pretty early on when I think when your mother was requesting uh, to meet me or to have a lunch or something, you know, she lives in Beijing, she doesn't see her daughter very often, we're doing these tours, and she had some powerful encounters uh, with her mother at that point because uh, her mother was curious, but, but we, our schedule was so full that Francis said, well, all of David's teachings have been translated to Mandarin, just, just read the website, bye. Uh, you know, to mom, who's like, so, so mom goes in, reads the website, mom's an atheist, not into spirituality whatsoever, she starts reading the website and going through all these ideas, and she immerses herself in the website, in the teachings in Mandarin, gets back on the phone with her daughter and says, so the roles of, like, mother and daughter, she starts to question who are you to me and who am I to you? If I follow these teachings I don't know what if we're not mother and daughter what and are you, we? What are we? <laughs> and you shared she was like, David's teaching this world is not real <laughs> <laughs> Mom gets What does into, that mean? <laughs> yeah, what does it mean? If, if the world is not real what are we? That's what she was saying, and I said, well, we are like the dreamer of the dream and the dream characters. You know that when you, you dream all the characters in your night dreams, this, this waking life is the same. And then she just kept asking, kept asking in the end, she said, so who am I is the only real question. I said, that's exactly mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. That's it. And then this atheist mother went, went into her first mystical experience after that oh. and had and called Francis up to say what do I do I've just had this experience of, of union and connection how do I how do I tell my friends about what I just experienced and Francis is like just for you you can't explain this it was it was all for you so because <clears throat> Francis didn't people please even with her mother because she went on to her mother was saying when can we meet what can we have lunch and Francis is like, no, no, our schedule is way too full. We will not, we will not be able to meet you. Uh, imagine going all the way to jail. No, all full, not this time. What about lunch? <laughs> it's like, you know, there's many, many stories that are, it's almost like there's a divine guidance under there, and there's love, and she's had many, many encounters, and her mother had a mystical experience, and there's been this tremendous awakening and undoing and expansion but it's come from staying with the purpose and, and not letting that swerve. And, like with, and with Susanna and Jeffrey, you came to the mystery school engaged, right? Engaged, engaged to be married, and then you could see from the movie there was some emotions coming up and an attraction coming up, and you were just expressing that, but in that kind of context, and then Jeffrey you had some reactions to <laughs> the expression of, of those in that context he was like oh my god what have I what have I gotten myself into I think yeah. is what you say yeah it was a huge what did I get myself into and it was funny because I think she stepped away but this idea of Francis and I just kept thinking she was on stage with us when we showed this at Awakening for Love and I was like oh if you could hear her speak now and even from my experience it's like Francis shared that we all had this prayer at the beginning, and mine was for trust. I wanted a deeper sense of trust with my brothers, the ones given to me by Spirit, and of course, with my relationship. And with Francis's situation, she came to our next event. She didn't cook at that one. She had this amazing, and she shared on stage that she doesn't have that. I need to cook for people anymore. Her prayer was answered in that. And for me, it was this, yeah, this deeper. I had past experiences of I was crushed by a relationship girlfriend that I probably would have married at the time and she ended up with a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. So I held everyone away from that point. I actually in fact got into drugs and alcohol for decades and I was unable to love in that way or let anybody in. And so even going into this I knew there was when I had met Susanna, there was already an attraction to Jason. It was there and I was like, wow. And it was more like I needed to step in to face this in my mind because if I 
decided to leave community or go back out to the world, that pattern would keep playing out in my mind. It would just happen over and over. So it's very intense going through it, as you can see when I was signing the marriage certificate and all that. <laughs> it's what am I doing? And that's where the moments of what Suzanne was saying, it's like, how do you know what's people busy? I can't. And those, I can't trust what I feel, and I have to come into a deeper level of trust with I've come into the movie team and into a relationship of, okay, I've devoted my life to a purpose. And now in those moments, I can't trust what I feel because I would have ran for the hills, mm -hmm. you know. But in those moments, it's I'm trusting what's given as the direction. Okay, you know, you're, when you can see that scene, even my role within the movie team was questioned. And I actually funded the entire movie. I was the producer, and I didn't make a single decision. <laughs> you know, if you look up what a producer does, they make the decisions, or the, you know, they're part of it. But it was a huge undoing for me, and a huge trust down to finances, like I shared in the movie. A lot of my self-concept was based around money, and when you have money, you can make a lot of decisions. I ran a company, all this stuff was what I thought was my worth. And I face it, and I still am watching those things that... I had an emotional experience back in Camas after I built the whole studio that we broadcast these weekend retreats and there was a shift and it's like, okay, you're going to be in this and other people and so the role switched and I was like, whoa, because I had taken it on so fully thinking that that was where my worth was, that now it was like, and I remember sitting there and we were in the gathering room and I literally just, I had this experience of, it was Utah and Suzanne and they were asking me something and all they wanted to do was know how I felt. And like I had all this emotion, I'm like, that's really all they want from me. Like they literally, I have this deep belief that people want something from me. But I saw in that moment it wasn't true and that's really what I was watching through the whole mystery school and it continued on, but it was like to be able to trust that I'm actually taken care of and that I don't have to defend myself, you know? And that belief, I forget what lesson it is or chapter, it's like I believe that the world is out to get me and I have to protect myself and so yeah that was a huge uh, huge part of my my lesson <laughs> from the mystery school and, yeah. you can get so much from this because if we get into the topic here of relationships or even marriage we could take them both um, it reminds me because I, I remember Susanna at one point you had maybe told your mother or your aunt or something where you said I, I, I don't ever want to get married so you didn't want to get married you really had no plans for that. And it starts to, you know, like in India with Gandhi and the arranged marriages and everything. It reminds me of one time I was on an airplane and I was, there was two women behind me. And there was an Indian woman and a, a woman from California. And they were having a discussion about marriage. And then it turned to the, you know, the woman, the Indian woman said, oh yeah. I was, I had an arranged marriage when I was 14 and it's 40 years later we're still together and the, 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 Ameri the woman from California was a guest at the idea of even of an arranged marriage. Did, did, you, did you know each other? Oh no, we didn't know each other. Uh, did, you, did you get to see him and date him and everything? Oh no, no. Our parents just arranged it. We, we came together for the first time at the wedding. <laughs> The woman from California was, I could just hear him behind me. She was, oh my God, I can't even believe that. And she said, oh, God takes care of us so much. God knows exactly what we need to heal. And God brought us together. And we didn't even know each other or see each other. But oh, it's been so much healing and it's so joyful. And the woman, the Indian woman was just bubbling of these 40 years of healing. Well, the, the woman from California was just like, horrified that, that these kind of decisions were made by your parents. And the woman was like, oh no, it's, it's the universe that does this. Uh, we trust so much in God and the universe and why would I think I know my, the best partner for me? I would never know. Uh, but, but God knows and so I take it when we meet for the first time at 14, whoa, so happy to meet you. I, I will spend this life with you, healing and everything. And then what it was, was a clash around guidance, around this idea that all things work together for good, this idea that 
that even in India, deep, the deep scriptures, uh, what was that, Slumdog Millionaire, the whole Indian movie Slumdog Millionaire is about one lesson, the script is written, and that all the signs and symbols, the things that he needed to win, win the amount of money and everything were all given to him perfectly, and in, in, in his context it was lovely. It was just confirming to him. And then at the end of the movie, there's a nice Bollywood dance, and there are all the colors, and they're dancing. But to the mind that's conditioned into the Western world, no. You are an individual person. You have individual choice. You have a will of your own. You need to make informed decisions. That's why you need good education. And when it comes to picking a marriage partner, you want to date, maybe date for... A number of years, you know, don't jump in. And you see, it was a clash. But I was sitting there just loving the conversation right behind me because I was saying, this is really what the Course is teaching us. The script is written. Jesus says that in the workbook. We were listening to the Real Alternative section. I think the Real Alternative section in A Course in Miracles is one of the most spectacular. Every time I hear it, I just get chills and goosebumps and heart cords moving because basically Jesus is saying that the entire world was projected, was made by the ego to keep you from knowing who you are and that what we value as choices in this world are really choices between illusions. Mm -hmm. This thing versus that thing and Jesus is saying in that section all of the roadways of the world lead to death. That's an amazing idea that all of the roadways of the world, all, he says, he doesn't say some, he doesn't say most, he said all of the roadways of the world lead to death. But there is a real alternative in your mind that the lesson is not that depressing lesson that all of the roadways of the world lead to death. That's the first part of the lesson. He says the second part of the lesson is the purpose. When you start to realize you, have this, you are this light, you are this love, you have a gift to extend, you, have, you are to realize who you are. This purpose of forgiveness, he calls it, is in there. And that's a real alternative. And when you realize that, he said, you are led to heights of happiness. So you go from the devastation of all the roadways of the world lead to death, to being carried to heights of happiness, the happy dream into the holy instant, you, into the, the real world, into, the tr into true perception, just from getting to the point where you realize, I can't decide my way out of here through illusions. I will never be able to discern which of these illusions will help me escape. Because the world was made that you would not escape. That every single road was made to, to block you from the light. So we were just listening to that this morning, I mean, I, I just was like, wow, I love that. I just get so lit up every time I hear that, because that's telling us, no, the script is written and you need not be concerned with the script. You can just be concerned about your purpose. Follow your intuition. Follow your joy. Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss. You know, that these teachings are right on. Follow that and trust how you feel. But Jesus even says that that's the one right use of judgment, is how do you feel? If that's the one right use of judgment, then that means you need to become totally honest with yourself in terms of feeling that joy, feeling that love, feeling that expansion, and not make any compromise where you think, oh, but what about this external? What about that external? As soon as you start to get into judging the externals or trying to factor that in, that's where the compromise comes in. So this is really amazing when you really think about it. This is like a straight shot to the Kingdom of Heaven, but it just requires a precision. You see, you've got the book. Oh, out. I, thought I had to look it up. Okay. <laughs> so, just for everyone, if you want to read it, yeah, you can uh, read it's that. chapter 31, the final vision, section 4, okay. I think. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I get so lit up with that. <laughs> the Real Alternative, number four, 653. Maybe, and the thing that's so beautiful about this is because I think you could say with, with Susanna and Jeffrey, you have a, a guided marriage here, 
Susanna is saying, I, I don't want to get married in this lifetime. And you saying, I, you know, you weren't exactly pondering on that since I've known you. Mm. Can't wait to get married. So this was like an arranged marriage by spirit, not, yeah. not their parents, even. <laughs> the parents involved. This was even more mystical because it was arranged by spirit. And then you can talk about how it's, how it's been and how it's gone for you in that because that's, that's what everybody wants to hear, you know. It's like, okay, you were brought together and they saw it in the movie and now it's like, here we are, that was two years ago? Yeah, two and a half years ago. Yeah, and actually it's great that he's bringing that up, that it was like, I didn't want to get married, that was not my plan. It was neither Jeffrey's plan, just... And I, I could also really say that I, I feel like it was needed to, for me to be brought together with someone by the Spirit, because I tried to pick my partners and that did not go well. Like, I didn't have good experiences, I had terrible relationships, so I'm like, I'm not going to do this again. And so that was, I can see that there's a huge, huge contrast with being with Jeffrey in this, in this type of relationship versus anything I experienced before. And just even when we, um, yeah, it was very intense in the beginning. <laughs> just a lot of emotions and a lot of fear of commitment actually on my part. And I feel like um, that's even, you know, there was a lot of attraction that came up towards Jason. I felt like my heart just opened up ever since I came to community. I was linked with him and it just felt like it was opening up more and more and more. And that was really why I was here. But I kind of put it on onto him as a person. Like I, I need to be with Jason. To, to, to feel that way and and um, yeah and then Jeffrey came into the picture and it, it was kind of interesting because um, in the end I could s I, I had to let go of that thought that I was linked to Jason and that's where it had to be or something there was a, a kind of an attachment like oh I, I know now where to get that feeling great let's let's do that like that's where I'll get it and that was not the plan it was actually just to share that feeling with Jeffrey. Like what I had experienced, I could these heart openings to actually include others in, instead of, okay, now I've got it for myself and that's it. And um, what I noticed when, when we got married, actually the last scene, right in that moment, <laughs> when we said yes, I could actually feel like all these fears dropped away. Like I, I had all this fear of committing to Jeffrey for marriage scared the shit out of me to be honest <laughs> <laughs> to think that that's for life that's for like a long time uh, I'm not sure if I, I, I'm up for that And but the moment the moment we said yes like this whole weight dropped from my shoulders that I didn't even know I was carrying like it just like it just dropped and I, I felt like this huge realization and just this this being able to really uh, to really be in love and relax or something like that I just felt like it was really coming up and it's been quite an adventure just <laughs> <laughs> just with things coming up but at the same time it's felt also very joyful very blessed to, to do that together like to really face these things together and not like in my previous relationships there were, were always two purposes you know one had like their plan for their lives and I had my plan and we would just see try try to do it together like it was always a compromise and with this it's like the same purpose so you're already united and then anything else that happens it just comes back to that purpose and that makes it so much easier actually <laughs> just to even share how you feel just to even be honest about your feelings you know because I feel before that I had to adapt or hide because I had to fit that, you know, plan or s some way because if I didn't, we, we might break up, I might lose my relationship and it feels like that, I mean, it, the feelings come up, like the, the fear of loss comes up, but it feels like it's just not, it's not the same somehow, mm. I'm not sure yeah. how. But <laughs> it seems to fit with the guidance discussion because Jesus is saying in the Course, you still believe that you can run some aspects of your life alone. In other words, okay, I'll give you my, this relationship for healing. 
but stay out of my bank account, Jesus. <laughs> and I'll give you this decision about maybe changing jobs. I'll, I'll trust you with that. But, oh, I like the autonomy of this, and I like this, and I like to do this, and this is the way I see my life going, and I have my future goals and my ambitions. And it's like saying to Jesus, you stay out of my future. You can work with my past if you want. Clean, scrub and clean the past up. But you stay away from my ambitions and goals for my future. The Course teaches us that the past is, and the future are defenses against the now, against the holy instant. The past is gone, the future is but imagined. These concerns, he's calling the past and the future concerns. These concerns are but defenses. Now he's calling the past and future defense mechanisms instead of projection and, and all these other denial, he's calling the past and the future defense mechanisms. These concerns are but defenses against present change of focus, which is really just present change of purpose. Am I willing to give the Holy Spirit my life, my mind, and saying, here, you guide me? Even with, with something like relationships, even with something like marriage, you know, that can seem to be like one of those things, like, well, I'll, I'll be guided on what to, maybe what to eat, or maybe, you, <coughs> Jesus, you can guide my exercise routine. But a, a life partner, you know, the, the ego is like saying, I'll pick that one. <laughs> you, can pick, you can pick some of the other ones, <laughs> but I will pick the life partner. I'm not leaving that up to you. Whereas that, that Indian woman, you know, the, the, her whole thing was like, oh, I, I love that I, who, my partner is being picked for me and I trust so deeply in the universe that I will learn the lessons I have to learn. You see how different that is from the mindset of thinking you're an autonomous person with experiences and dating experiences and relationship experiences and never going to make that mistake again. And, you know, and yet we do make the same mistakes. Even when we say, I will never make that mistake, I will never marry another alcoholic. I've had women tell me, I married five alcoholics. And each time I said, I will never do that again. And then lo and behold, what is this karmic kind of crazy repetition of the past repeating over and over, even against my personal will? And it's because we, we really don't really have a personal will. You know, we have a will that, that can line up with God's will for perfect happiness that we could call real. But this other ego will is just something to be undone, something that we're here to surrender, that we're here to release. So I love that we're able to show with the movie and through these discussions that, that it's like boldly saying, direct my relationship choices, direct everything in my life. In fact, there's some of you know who study the Course, at the very end of the book there's the rules for decision. And Jesus said, your one remaining problem is you decide first and then ask. Mm. And he's like, whoops, <laughs> we need a little flip there. You need to ask first and then decide. And what's the decide? Holy Spirit, decide for God, for me. You hear how even that choice, listen, ask, and then decide for God, for me. Show me the way. You make the decisions. You make the financial decisions. You make the travel decisions. You make the relationship decisions. You make the diet decisions. You make the exercise decisions. You make the sleep decisions. You make my movie watching decisions. You make my internet decisions. Imagine if you give your life so fully over and say, decide for God, for me, with everything, and don't hold pockets of, of like a little corral of, of private areas where you don't want to trust the Holy Spirit. That's what the transfer of training, that's what the workbook is about, to help transfer the training of the lessons across the mind. So it's like this beautiful light just sweeps across like a lighthouse, does a full 360 sweep in your mind, all the way around your mind, and there's nothing left but light. Uh, because you have not held any compartmentalized little uh, areas. <laughs> Gabriel. Yeah, so I need to speak. <laughs> um, I'm like, see, that's exactly what's happened in the past weeks, you know. I 
don't remember consciously asking for this so specifically but it's like so much I'm doing you know and I didn't want to get married then I got married met my husband at the spiritual retreat 16 years ago at a time where it was the least on my mind because I was flying high with this guru I I we have a daughter she's 10 I never wanted children you know didn't want this whole thing and then I even thought of we were living in Bali then and I thought I'm not, I'm not having a child where does this come from you know that doesn't fit with my life you know I was so so in a state of terror and I thought I, I'm, I'm going to find a Balinese gynecologist and ask about abortion and we went there and and so he's there's like this you know the ultrasound and so I'm there, I'm seeing this whole thing, so he's all excited, like, congratulations, wonderful, uh, 1.5 centimeters, seven and a half weeks old, estimated birth, and I was just like, uh-huh, uh-huh, and it was like, why don't you ask that question? Why don't you ask that question? I didn't ask the question, so we left the room, I was just like, well, it seems like we're going to have a baby in August. That's how it was. And and it was it was hard for me, being a mom and understanding okay that's a whole other story but um, what's what's uh, happening for me is um, like what what Jeffrey said with this worth thing you know I've always felt so <laughs> see my husband is like he's doing it all he's like the mother at home you know he's like He's so close with her. I was so focused on my spiritual path, so I kind of get all this faith from spirit. But um, it's the last week. She starts school again, and I was going through some stuff, and he's like, you know, no problem. I got it handled all, and I didn't even like it because I was like, I have nothing else to contribute to this family. Like, I'm not driving. He says, I'm doing the pickup. I... um. I will, he looks at me, I will get her, you know, and, and I just feel like, hey, you're taking everything away, I have nothing to contribute, you know, I felt like my whole concept is just, you know, how you say it, getting the rug pulled. Yeah, and so, and there's nothing to hold on to, I'm like, why am I even in this family, or why am I, why do I even exist, you know, if I don't contribute dinner or lunch or even drive her around or you know it's so it's so it's so identified with doing those things and when and it's like terrifying and it's it's not only terrifying I can see um, I see it as a good thing I welcome it I'm glad because I feel there's this there's this I sense this freedom behind this, you know, that this is what I really pray for, but it's just, um, and I see that, you know, over the years, I mean, so many things, <laughs> I mean, also, I'm just, uh, <laughs> what's on my mind is like, we're so taken care of with the healing, you know, it's so, like it's all happening for me and I just I don't know yeah I think like it's, it's, it's emotional for me you know yeah, yeah. I'm a, <laughs> I've been trying so I've had such a phase of doing it all right and discipline and everything and, and now it's just like handing even more over you know it's like less doing and what I said actually to Carly and Gabriella, they were staying with me, <laughs> and I said, "What? Well, one thing I got out of the movie, or even the meeting yesterday, is like, no, no more doing it alone. You know, finished, finished. You know, this is it. I'm not going to try to heal. I mean, I got so far, thinking I was part of it, but I'm like." I'm just in the way, really. It's just there's nothing it can contribute. This 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 ego thing that thinks it knows what it's doing. 
God, thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense, yeah. but yeah. it's just like... Yeah. That's a carryover from what you shared yesterday when you were sitting there, yeah. where you were just starting to see that, that, that the personal involvement, you know, which is, was still assumed to be there, now it's starting to be rinsed. And, and it's a bit... It reminds me of, of a scene in this movie, in my movie watcher's guide to enlightenment, called The Abyss. They're going down to the deep trenches of the ocean so deep where the, the pressure is so, so intense. And the way that the, the, one of the main characters can go down and be dropped down into these trenches where, where the pressure is so enormous is that they have to wear, have a suit on that literally is a pressure suit so that, so that they aren't crushed uh, by, by it. And also they can't breathe air down there. Uh, they have to breathe liquid oxygen. So they have to train on taking in into their nostrils and lungs liquid. But there's a reaction in, in mammals to liquid going into lungs. There is a very strong instinctual reaction. The Course of course tells us that the body doesn't even have instincts. It's all in the mind. Consciousness gives even instincts to the body. <laughs> there is no life in the body, it's this neutral thing. But from the perspective of being a human being, the main character, they have to put the mask on and then they have to fill the mask up with liquid oxygen. And there's like a, a struggle that goes on because it's like it's a reversal of everything that the mammal has experienced. That's like a survival, we might say, move to no, a drowning kind of move, liquid going into nostrils and, and lungs. And here he has to relax and first he fights it and fights it and then he just has to kind of do it. And then he's even told ahead of time that when you breathe the liquid oxygen, you know, it, you have to do, exert more force because it's heavier than air. So you'll have a, a so he has to totally go. And that's reminded me of what you're going through on this spiritual journey where Gabriel was like a key factor. Gabriel with the guru, Gabriel in Bali, Gabriel with the spiritual practices. Gabriel was a big part of, of everything. And then you start to get to a deeper point. And Jesus even describes it in the Course in the stages of the development of trust. Early on in the stages of the development of trust, Jesus says, it will seem as if things are being taken away from you. And he says that's not the case. It's just that your mind is starting to devalue the illusions. And, and they're just naturally drifting the attachments, the control, the possession that once seemed to be part of the human persona. It's not really a sacrificial thing. It will seem as if things are being taken away from you. We've even got a, a movie in our ultimate it's called The Ultimate Gift in our Movie Watcher's Guide where um, James Garner plays one of the characters and, and someone's afraid about losing all their money and he's from Texas and he's like, hell, I've lost everything twice in my life. Best thing that ever happened to me. You know, in a Texan accent, you know. Like, really, it's all part of dismantling. Where for most people, they're thinking like, that's the worst thing that could ever happen to you. And he's like, oh, hell, I've done that twice best thing ever happened to me. You know, that's what it is in the spiritual journey where the things that seem to have been valuable it could be it could be a child, it could be the family, it can be partners, that even when people have someone that disappears in their life and they have a sense of grief and loss with it, that's just triggering that belief in loss in the mind, which is of course the ego, to bring it up for healing. So it's not that we actually ever lose anything, it's just that we believe that we can, and when we believe it, we perceive it. We, we interpret loss because of the, the belief. We interpret abandonment sometimes, abandoned by a father or a mother or a parent or a partner, when actually it's just this deep ego belief in abandonment that's getting projected out and acted out in the scenes. So that's why the Course is so helpful, because it's saying, no, everything is always working together for your good, and it will seem like you relinquish judgment, 
and it will seem like you relinquish fear, but really it's just starting to see that they were, you never had them in the first place. You never were really capable of taking on fear, of taking on the ego. So we're, you've got yeah. such support now I mean, around you. I really feel like I'm going to watch this movie because I really feel that's the feeling I have. I mean, I'm like I see where with all this and that's so much I'm doing already been done the past, you know, my whole life. And now I really feel like I'm like, I'm almost like, where is this going? I mean, yeah, it's great, but this is, this is a lot falling away. And I've, it seems like I'm exactly this. Exactly what you described. That's what it feels like, and it's like, it's like, yeah, great. And then it's like, I don't know. This is like total no man's land, like no, not knowing land. It's really like, <coughs> what, where's this going? What is this? What is this? You know? Yeah. And there's no and no concept jumping in. No, no plan. No nothing. It's like. And it's like, that's me, you know, yeah. me having no plan, no clue, no, no grabbing onto something. Yeah. This yeah. person. We're so used to like a diagnosis model, like, okay, I have to diagnose the problem, I have to figure it out, I have to bring forth the means, and I have to solve the problem. And the Course is saying, as I said in the movie, you can't really know the problem that the plan is meant to solve. <laughs> you can put your faith in the plan, you can put your faith in the healing and the correction. Like here, I give all my faith over to the healing, and I'm not even going to try to diagnose the ego. I'm not even going to try to figure the ego out. If the ego is a death wish, what makes us think we could figure out a death wish? And would you really want to analyze and figure out a death wish? And what would you gain? <laughs> I go, okay, I got it down now. I figured out this ego stuff. It's a death wish. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I still believe in it. Uh, see, that, that unfortunately gives it away. It's like, <laughs> you didn't really figure out anything. Another way that Jesus says it, he says, peace and understanding go together and cannot be found apart. Mm. Isn't that lovely? Peace and understanding go together. That means if you're still going through the undoing, you don't know peace and you don't understand anything. <laughs> because why? Peace and understanding go together. So, isn't it better to just come up honestly and say, I don't know. I mean, I went to a, a Buddhist gathering out here in California maybe 20 years ago and we're all sitting around, and we're going to meditate and everything, and then suddenly the facilitator decides to start a chant. And so I'm like, oh cool, a chant. I'm in California, we're doing a chant. I'm a, and the chant was, I know nothing. <laughs> and so for two hours we were, I know nothing. I was so happy. I was just, I was like, this is the best meditation I've ever had. I'm chanting that for two hours. But you see how that fits in with the Course in Miracles. It's saying, you know, you have to empty your mind of every thought you've ever had, every feeling, every emotion. Hold on to nothing. Do not bring with you one thought that the past has taught, or nor one thing you've ever learned from anything before. That's basically feeling the love. That's the feeling of love of God. I feel the love of God. Yeah, that's, that's lesson 189. 189 yeah. yeah, that's it. And that's the, that's like, let it all go. Yeah. And I that's mean, it. to me, that's always the key. Whenever I'm in a spot, whether I think I'm in a great spot or a bad spot, it's, it's I'm getting too wrapped up in it. I'm just, just, just being in that faith. I mean, you turn it, okay, so I don't know what chapter it is, but we studied it in our class where you turn over to the Holy Spirit everything in, in, in your day, right? And you have faith in the Holy Spirit. If you dedicate your goal to be the goal of truth through the Holy Spirit, and the level of faith that you put in the Holy Spirit to bring you to truth is directly proportional to the level of happiness that you'll begin to feel when everything in your life is given over. 
That means you have faith that everything, good, bad, or indifferent in your life is there for your healing. It's there for you to grow. It's like the setting the goal section. Put the goal out front, yeah. and then you, you see everything and, is working for you. And when, when, when you try to make sense of it, and even when you try to talk to it, really, which you do a fabulous job of talking to it, it's, it's like there's a part of you that wants to own that. And that's the part to be watchful of, to be mindful of. is that part that wants to own it. I want to own the process, right? I want to be in charge of it again, <laughs> right? That yeah, that's me. the personality just, thing. That's beautiful. Right. That's a beautiful description of as soon as that part that wants to own it, figure it out, call it, this is mine. You know, whatever it is, then that's then it's you lose. What is it uh, Papa G that said something to the effect of um, be aware of that part of you that strives for ambition, that has the ambition. Be aware of that part. Be mindful. That's a clue. I think too, like for Gabrielle, it it always helped me to have examples of way showers. I mean, Jesus says in the course, he says. Uh, you can you can learn from my experiences, and that's why I've I've even enjoyed reading about Jesus in the Bible or the Urantia book and so on and so forth. Because, because as a, a believer in stories, as a believer in time and space, really the, the ego made them all up. But the spirit can use the parables to say, "I got gotcha. you." Like here's just like a reminder. And I remember I had students back in the 1990s where they. They would get freaked out about, oh my God, am I going to lose my husband? Am I going to lose my family? And I'd say, well, you can read some books from the ancient female mystics in India and all the experiences they went through. Or Mary Baker Eddy, I mentioned her, you know, the founder of Christian Science. She, Susanna was talking about difficulty in relationship. Mary Baker Eddy had really difficult relationships and really difficult relationships. And then she, uh, uh, she was married to a dentist and um, she got so sick that they took her child, social services back in the 1800s took her child away from her and gave it to a foster family who moved to Oklahoma. That's, that's what happened to her child. It was taken by social services and taken out of her life and then she spent all the time writing science and health with key to the scriptures, you know, that's like the 1800s version of A, of a Course in Miracles so to speak. And then when she finally got to the point where she got through these very difficult, painful relationships and divorces, she married her first student, Aisha Eddy. And so she that was like Susanna saying, I'll find the one who's who's gonna bring me everything. I'll bring me the heart opening and I'll marry the heart opening one. And she married her first student and then she went through another dark period where it seemed like her students were viciously attacking her because she was, uh, I think she gave one class in, I think it was in New England, Boston area, where she was giving a class to a group of students and out of her mouth came, I am infallible. Mm -hmm. And over half the students <laughs> got up and walked out of the class and a lot of them just viciously on her and her infallible, cannot make, cannot make a mistake. And, and then have, over half the students left, you know, because she had this great presence. But the, the students seemed to be so vicious that her husband was there with all these vicious seeming attacks on his wife. And literally, they said, Aisha died of a broken heart. He couldn't stand to watch his wife attacked. So these were all experiences she went through. and. And these are all things that I, I see as just witnesses that when you answer the call, you are going for in a, a remembrance of God, which is a remembrance of eternity. And it's the ego that judges the things in form. Like you were saying, it says, oh no, not this, oh no, not this. No, it's, it seems like it's losing its identity. And that the very things that make up its self-concept, its self-image, are slowly getting rinsed and washed away. So it just takes faith, but we're in this with, we're all in this together. You know, you've got, look at all your mighty companions around you <laughs> as you go through this, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's quite amazing. Okay, let me just basically myself. Yesterday, it's about, yesterday when you left, it 
you talked about a little of when you meet somebody, did you make that connection that you said, this is what something you're feeling here, something is moving? Yes. And I've had that experience. And one, but this is the first question. Why don't you feel that with everybody if we're in that mood of love? And because I was married by that people who were separated and I uh, have been five years separated and I met this person. And when I see Susan and Jeffrey, something that she said, like, it connected me with that because when I saw him, he was like, okay, when we were in uh, 35 years, 35 years past, when I saw him again, it was like, it's this. And I feel it immediately. And I don't know if it's the mind, it was really from Jesus who came that you say, the Spirit got these souls together, or you know, a lot of mm -hmm. things that they say. And right now that Jeffrey and Susan, they passed for very difficult experience in relationships. We, right now we have four years, but we're like struggling, trigger, getting that dark side out. And <coughs> the first two years were like romance, something very nice. And now we're getting everything out where we really have that dark side of the soul that we think we're happy. And we're very separated right now. And when she said right now that day that I said, we both we said we're going to get married again, we over it, because he has the same, <coughs> separated the same, but he has to close those circles. Like I think, well, why I see there is mine maybe. But when she said, the day that we married, and that day there were everything, all the scare went out of you, that's why maybe I've tried to tell him sometimes, maybe we were like scared we're not going to be together, we're going to be, and we're like protecting that what comes out, no, don't go away because he's not ready or we're not ready or my decision was my baton separate. He's not ready, he's not putting in that much effort and my putting in you know that's struggling. And then my question is, is it really true that there's something that you feel with some person and you why don't you feel it with the other with others? Because I have a bit great my best friend that he's like Look at me, I don't feel that. But I feel it here. Yeah. Like Susan said, with you really you connected, you said, I feel this something with Jeffrey. That peace came inside of you and you know something nice was going inside of you. That's my question. I don't know if yeah. you understand. Oh yeah, that. we love these questions. That's fantastic. Well, in Why terms of relationship, person? you know, there's a beautiful section <laughs> in the manual for teachers where the question is asked, you know, about what are the levels of, of relationship, and Jesus describes um, three levels. First of all, he yeah. says, in, in truth, there are no levels. Isn't that great? He starts off, <laughs> what are the levels? Oh, there aren't any. Uh, and yet, here, I'll throw you a bone. You know, I'll give you something to chew on a bit, cause, because I know you're, you're very curious and interested about relationships. So, the casual encounters... The meet, to meeting in an elevator, people bumping into a child, bumping into an adult, you know. There's the first level, which is just these casual encounters seemingly with strangers. Okay, that's one level. Then there's, there's these very quite intense teaching learning situations that, up, in which they appear to separate. So this can go on for months or years and then they, they appear to separate because each has learned the most that they can, where learning is maximized. So now he's describing relationships where the learning is maximized, where people go their way, but actually it's, they've actually maximized that relationship. So, I mean, when I was going through some of my biggest heartaches, I read that and I was like, hallelujah. You mean I'm dying here and grieving <laughs> every day and I, I'm crawling around on the floor and you're telling me oh it was just maximized no big deal uh, read That's on what I say to him because we're like I feel we are the, the thing is we're in Cross America both we're on the same um, uh, road yeah, yeah, yeah. this is mine this is yours okay yeah. we, we talk very nice we understand there's a lot of chemistry and a lot of yeah. things yeah. but I think he doesn't get do that step Maybe she's not ready, and I feel like I'm, like he said, I'm in faith with God, I'm Jesus, what you want me to do today, I'll do it. I'm like, 
I'm yeah. on it in him. What he yeah. wants me to do, I'm like that. Then I want to pressure. Well, the, the third one is lifelong. There are, the script is written, and there are destined lifelong relationships where you're given a chosen learning partner for life. And then he says, but they, they, they may uh, have resistance. In other words, they may be hostile to each other. This is the lifelong one. I'm like, you should see my eyes pop out as I'm reading what a lifelong one. I'm like, they need to get to the soulmate part, the good stuff. Jesus says, lifelong relationship, and they may be hostile to each other, perhaps for life. Oh, Jesus Christ. Come on. Where's the Cinderella story here? This is like, this is not, perhaps for life, but if they decide to learn it, the perfect lesson is before them and can be learned. Oh my God! Now those are just those are just the, the levels, but I think in the end, what you can say is all of this is kind of a backdrop. The relationships are just a backdrop to, to opening to coming to the holy instant, where you start to desire this deep communion, this deep connection with God, and you go deeper and deeper and deeper in this. And the deeper you go towards the holy instant, which which is the holy instant ultimately takes you beyond perception because Jesus says in the Course, at no single instant does the body exist at all. It is always remembered or anticipated. So he's describing it like this projection that really isn't true. And, and it's never, you're, you never can have the body in the holy instant because there are no bodies. It's just blazing light. You just go right into that light. So the key thing I think is is the practice of learning to just every day to just come to that place of I I do not know, I cannot judge. You show the way, you make it obvious, you lead the way, you know, when you really get into that like tractor beam of that, then the questions around the relationships start to loosen. Because you start to realize that everything in this world is symbolic. You know, you may have a heart opening watching a movie. Uh, uh, or you may have it in, in, in interacting with somebody or eye gazing. That's when my revelatory experiences happened. All three times I was eye gazing with a woman and we were just sitting very still and we were just sitting in silence and eye gazing and then the figure ground collapsed and then the, the bright light, the light of heaven started blasting through the, the scene and then, it, then the bodies were gone and it was all just light. But it, I was just in this place of doing the course, eye gazing with a woman, in three different scenarios. One was in a kitchen, one was in a woods where we took a table out and some chairs, and one was in a rowboat where we were being blown along <laughs> slowly on a lake and doing eye gazing in the boat. And then the whole world disappeared. That's what we're going for, is just that deep devotional thing. Not even trying to figure the relationships out, because I see that it's all just signs and symbols. When we get really devoted in what we want, we really get devoted to the purpose, then the signs and symbols will just light up all over the place. I mean, you just start to see them everywhere. Fortune cookies and bumpers and bumper stickers and billboards and, you know, we, we see a lot of them. Yes. Well, even if you look at, at the original four with the Course in Miracles, they didn't really live together. Um, they all had their parts. You know, Helen the scribe, Ken the teacher, Bill the, the what would you say, support and comfort, and uh, Judy the publisher and the, the connector. But they didn't live together. I do find, though, as you go very, very deep into this, that 
to me, I, I have went really deep into this and then I got happier and happier and happier. Then I just started to have reflections of happiness and had people started to come up to me, can I move in with you? Uh, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. You get happy and then you have people that want to live with you. Or if they can't live in your house, they, they start buying houses on the same street. Uh, that's what started to happen to me in Cincinnati. I'm like, who's that? Who moved in? Oh yeah, they moved in, they're renting this house, and they're renting this house, and it's like the street started to light up. It was called Station Avenue. It felt like a train station, which had people who were buying houses. So what I find is, even with our community, that we do have, I feel, really lifelong relationships. There's very deep devotion there, and it starts to reflect out in terms of the relationships. And even when some go traveling or go their way, this and that, we kind of have this feeling like we're so connected, we're going to crisscross, like we're, we're going to meet each other on the other side of the mountain or when we least expect it. And I actually feel that, that there are no accidents when we come together, so the feeling in my heart is that we are in a lifelong relationship. Of course, if we're hearing this all together, if I'm speaking it, you're hearing it, you're speaking it, you know, we're here witnessing to that awakening. We are like, these are the witnesses, like a quantum uh, reflection or witness of, of our desire to wake up. That's just the way it seems really obvious to me. The way you're describing it too is still kind of a very, it's like interpersonal, lifelong relationship. And then as he says, and if they decide to learn it, the perfect lesson is before them and can be learned. To me that's, that's why you do the practice, that's why you practice every day, because how, how optimistic that is. And if they decide to learn it, the perfect lesson is before them and can be learned. That's just like Jesus giving a green light, saying, you know, keep your devotion strong and, and keep the practice going. And then, uh, like that Kenny Loggins song, wait a little while to welcome what you're after. Give it some time to find its way to you. As soon as you no longer try, you turn around, it's staring in your eye. Come and get it. If you let it, it will come to you. Beautiful Kenny Loggins song. Wait a little while. I wasn't recording, I'd play it for all of us. <laughs> On Apple Music. <laughs> Wait a little while. Kenny Loggins. Yes? Uh, I don't have a question as much as a uh, commentary about your film and the experiences I had going through it and watching it. <laughs> First of all, I want to say, Susanna and, and Jeffrey, thank you for being willing to allow yourself to be documented going through your healing process. It was incredibly powerful and a beautiful ending. And Jeffrey, thank you for singing my song, too. <laughs> 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 you know, that, that song, Singing, uh, 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 what's that song? Uh, singing My Life. Softly, oh, Roberta that? Fleck. Yeah. 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 The film was like that. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> so, Francis, my, my experience, first of all, what you did there and how powerful it was, it was like I finally was able to see and experience the true meaning of there are no private thoughts. And that we are, there is only one mind, including the ego mind. Because, you know, it's, it, was, it was all there on, on film. You had documented it. And I was like, one. Well, what is it? Did you get get together and probably go, let's do a documentary on Sean's private thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> I was in there watching it, and it was like, you know, including all the pain, the anger, the sadness, the, the loss, and the embarrassment. You know, and like, the kitchen scene, really? You have to be so accurate with that, too? <laughs> you know, and I, I, was just, I was just watching this one. God, that's, that's you know, it's like all, all you know, get together all the players, the actors, the script is written, obviously, because there's my private thoughts out there on screen. You know, and just when we're getting to the end, I thought, okay, this is almost over. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then it was, it was, and she's like, but wait, there's more. And I was like, wait till the ending. And, and the uh, filmmaker did. The Sorry. ending on him, I was like, okay, 
You know, can I just have one private thought? <laughs> <laughs> nope. It's the world premiere of Sean's private thought. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, but it, and it was just so true. Oh. That it, I mean, we're all playing each other's parts, thinking that there were that were we have our private thoughts. But it was just so clear that you had documented that private thoughts and that, and all the characters were playing the same thoughts that we all have, and the same experiences. The form may be different, but the content is the same. And so. You know, the impact of what you did here by your decision to follow Jesus' message and his guidance, and without doubt, and to put that out there for us so we can finally see this is what our private thoughts look like. We think we think they're private. They're not. Mm-hmm. And, that, and it was like I finally made that connection. And we should, you know, this is what you did for me, and hopefully everybody else got that, that same kind of experience. That, okay, good. I don't have to, you know... Hide my private thoughts any longer. Like so, you know, you're you're, you're welcome to use my mind now because apparently it's wide open. <laughs> you know, there's, there's nothing private anymore. So, but so, thank you so much for what you did. Yeah, I, it just had a huge impact. I know for me, and you know, <laughs> thank you for singing my song. But thank you. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Mark, space, Mark yeah. I really enjoyed the movie, and the scenery was stunning, because you know, the story of the documentary is part of it, really great, but I had the same question Suzanne had about Francis and Jen, and to some extent about Suzanne and Jeffrey, and what I couldn't help thinking was that the context that you provided here made that completely crystal clear, would be so much more powerful than was in the movie. Yes. Give the background on Frances that she was making pain in her legs. She's done all these cooking, she's been a professional chef all her life, and she wants to get out of it. And then all of a sudden, she has the opportunity to get out of it, and it's resistance. That wasn't as clear as I think it could have been. And the same thing with you know, Jeff and Susanna. So, I, I just, that's, that was my instant feedback. Because I felt a little bit detached from the beginning, I couldn't really connect characters as much as I really wanted to, because I didn't, I didn't have that whole context going in my head. The other thing I do want to say about relationships, I was married for 35 years to a woman with whom we fought, we fought all the time. We had at least one big argument a month for the whole time. And I did not recognize that as the only experience that I know it was. And it actually got worse after the health. But I was looking, I went out looking for another relationship because I like being in a relationship. And I couldn't find it. And I finally, I went to this one event where I went in and I was like, okay, I'm just going to go and enjoy the event. Mm-hmm. And I met Patricia, who I've been with for almost four years now. So I'm learning more and more that the best way to go through my life is to drop the expectations. Mm-hmm. Because the more I hold on to them, this hurts when they don't happen and things are really awful and they're not. It's always a blessing. Always. And it, I, I'm in a transition period right now because my company was just taken over and I have to find another job by somewhere in mm-hmm. November. And my immediate reaction was, oh crap. And then I thought, no way, this is perfect. God will provide them. He always does. He never fails. I just trust in that. And things are really Thank you for being here. That was an unexpected pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that feedback. Because really, actually, too, you know, I feel like part of our joy is is sharing the whole context with you. We come to share our hearts, and that's why, even as the movie was released, we weren't thinking of it as a product, or we weren't thinking of it as, <coughs> as something that has a beginning and an end. But the context of being with you and sharing the full context of the backstory. Do you remember that show, uh, what was it called, The, the Rest of the Story, yeah. of Paul Harvey? Always had a, show, a radio show called The Rest of the Story. And for us, that's why 
the movie is, is being shown and released in the context of this because we're with all of you, we feel your sincerity and your love and your precious desire for awakening and healing and it's almost like that's like a little seed that we're here and we're watering it and we're putting all the soil and the fertilizer so we can all go into that experience and, uh, and the movie is a very big part of that although within a certain time it's frame it's not the only part it's not the only part yeah I always feel like there is so much that I want to put in so much I it was just impossible to give all the context and the background so <coughs> and to have it like a compact um, not too long that's why we, we really feel this is the only way we can show it in the degree that we can do it justice the movie and and a, a workshop like this because how deep this this really is and, and the biggest context that's behind this work and behind what everybody is going through. So, yeah. Could you do a postscript? Like a little backstory postscript with the movie? Like a but you know, in the, in Awakening to Love, um, we, when we did the premiere in the monastery, the next day we had a panel with not only Susanna and Jeffrey, but Francis Romero and Soren. Uh, Soren lives in our Spain community, so he beamed in on internet, and we have a whole screen to, uh, dedicated to him, so we have all of us, and people could really ask all the questions, and then one, one participant said, you know, this should go together with the movie as a follow-up, because, so we, we recorded it, and then we added it into another video, so we will, yeah, we will see whether it can be released together. <laughs> Do you have a question? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I also have uh, something to add to this whole thing with the people in the kitchen. <laughs> it's funny how I totally got it. So it's really interesting. We all have our own mm -hmm. stories that are going to relate or not relate. Um, not necessarily the form of what she did before she was a cook or a chef. It didn't matter. All I saw was there was resistance, mm -hmm. and then there was forgiveness. Yeah. And however that came about didn't really matter. Yeah. It was just a story. But I really got a lot out of that. And I want to thank you guys, because the part about the guy singing, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, when they great. turned it around, great. everything opened up. It yeah. was so, so <laughs> appreciated. I loved that part. It was amazing. And thank you guys for being so vulnerable, uh, well, invulnerable, I should say, and just opening up and saying, hey, here's our story, and allowing us all to touch into that and relate to that. Um, but my question is the script. So if we come in with a script, and I was hoping you can give me your feedback on this. Now, to do it, can the script be collapsed through forgiveness? Does it shift through forgiveness? Does it... Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, that's, that's a metaphor, is that, that saving time, that's what miracles do. They literally bring the Alpha and the Omega together. They literally collapse time. So if we use a reincarnational perspective where it's going to take, um, we'll say, 42 lifetimes to remember union with Source, um, it seems in perception that there, there's a collapsing that occurs. But again, that's a metaphor because what never happened uh, need not be collapsed. Uh, I was talking quantum physics a bit, uh, metaphors up at Huntington Beach, and there was a woman who was like, yeah, yeah, I'm into the quantum, quantum, quantum. And then when I started talking Jesus, because one of my books is <coughs> Quantum Forgiveness, Jesus, or no, Quantum Forgiveness, Physics, Meet Jesus. That's the title <laughs> of the book. And she was like, hmm, I like the quantum physics, but wait a minute, didn't Jesus come here and die for our sins and redeem the whole, you know, with the Judeo-Christian kind of the story and everything. So I kind of gave a context. It was actually the resurrection, and that occurs in the mind. When I say the script is written, which is a line from the workbook of the Course, 
that really has destiny um, kind of implications. Like, what if everything that I perceive is the past? And so that last word of the script is written, that's a past tense word. Mm -hmm. Really, the script is written is just lesson number seven from A Course in Miracles workbook. I see only the past. So imagine that everything that you're perceiving is all the past. Pull it back a little and you can see like, wow, so that's what he means by this world was over long ago. But the distortion of, of splitting the past up into two dualities. See how the, the mind split but it projects it out onto time and then we have the past and the future and then we believe that the present moment is in between the past and the future. My mother was a history teacher so I, I used to draw the time and then all the little marks on there and the little arrows, you know, and then and here's the present. But the present was placed on the line. And that's the trick of the ego. It tells us the present is between the past and the future. So when I had students, they would start talking about things that happened to them and regrets that they had and grievances and everything. And I'd say, oh, that's the past past. And then they would talk about their future goals and ambition. I'd say, oh, that's the future past. Past past or future past. It's all past. Why do psychics, why did Nostradamus, Nostradamus see things missiles flying, world wars, you know, it's because he wasn't really visioning the future, he was envisioning the past, the future past. And that's the, the, the biggest leap that it takes when you go for spiritual awakening. You start to realize it's a time addiction. The mind that believes it's like on the timeline is asleep. And the, and the character that seems to exist on the timeline is just a figment of imagination, as so all the characters are. And really your question is, is like, so is there a collapse? It seems in experience, like when you give yourself over to this awakening, things will seem to collapse. Maybe even the time it takes to change your mind, you know, where as before you were would go, like Mark was saying, you know, like going to the city, it's just like once a month, you don't have that anymore, right? You don't, you're, not, you're not in that kind of experience. So that's a miracle, that's like, it's oh, like yeah. a collapse, where, and, and even coming to that collapse, you may start to realize, wow, I can kind of give myself over to the miracle and turn it around much faster. The, the distance of time that I hold on to that grievance seems to get shorter and shorter and shorter. Where it's all leading is, is kind of like just a, a giving yourself over to desiring the holy instant and desiring a state of mind in which you place less and less importance on the things of time. And you're more and more drawn deeper inward, like all the mystics and saints. But it's also with a feeling like everything is perfectly taken care of. Like some of you might have seen that uh, I think it was the Little Buddha movie, you know, where, where Buddha, you know, leaves the palace and, and goes out, and then when the Buddha is sitting to meditate, even the plants will come, um, when it's raining, the plant, the leaf comes over Buddha's head. It starts to be your experience, the things just start to show up, everything you need, everything you need to hear, it's all divinely orchestrated, that's like that time collapse feeling. Like you're, Jesus is saying that for every miracle you experience, you save a thousand years as the world would judge it. A thousand years of linear time with each miracle that you experience. And that's why he's encouraging us, like in the I need do nothing section, he said, well there's long periods of meditation, fighting against sin, contemplation, you know, he rattles off a lot of the traditional ways to reach God, your way will be different. A holy relationship is given you as a means of saving time, as a means of, we'll say, time collapse. And then he goes on to describe that holy relationship, where he says, you and your brother are together. Well, that's just using the symbol of brothers and sisters and saying you are together. You're the same mind. You are, there's only one of us, and there's always only been one of us. 
But he's like saying, will you come with me on a journey to use relationship instead of pushing it away and going to the mountains and saying, I'm going to live off and up by myself and no distractions, cover my eyes or cover this. You know, he's like saying, no, his workbook is full of like open-eyed meditations every day using whatever you perceive is part of the mind training. So it's very different from... But if you have a script with some, let's say, you say a life partner, maybe there was that script. Mm. And one person decides to do the work and is making up. And now that relationship may not be that whole lifetime. Is that possible if the script was already written? Can you change the script? If we're the dreamer of the dream, then we recreate something that wasn't real in the first place? Well, it's, it's back to that idea of of recreate in the sense that, that for me that state of the script is written or that I see only the past is, is so so profound because imagine if you started to have an experience that, that I see only the past I mean everything that I'm perceiving then if it's the past why would I want to change the past <laughs> and how could I change the past you know how a lot of spiritualities talk about go back redo the script or recreate this, you know, there's a lot of teachings that are still manipulating. Or even when people talk to me about manifesting, you know, they say, you know, I kind of like it, uh, you know, Deepak, you know, learning how to manage, what was the Sai Baba, you know, jewelry and bracelets and everything, they're kind of fascinated with the idea of manifesting. And, and I'll say, well, you probably won't want to hang around with me too much, because I am always teaching the impossibility of manifesting. It's not a popular workshop. I never get anybody to show up. You know. I'm doing a free workshop on the impossibility of manifesting. David, he's just gone now. He's just weak. He's just gone. He's not making any money. Uh, now he's telling me manifesting is impossible. But let's look at this for a minute. Manifesting is still implies that, that you can change the script. Even bringing forth, see, I brought forth an orange watch. But, <laughs> I didn't call upon Sai Baba or anything, but, but the thing about it is, to believe that manifesting still believes that you can use the power of the mind to change the script. But if the script is written, if it's all just the past, if it's all equally the past, and if it's all the same, the past and the future are, are, are the same, then awakening must be that the realization of that Course teaching, seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind about the world. Seek not to manifest, which would still imply that you're looking at the script and you're saying, okay, I'm going to use the power of mind, the power of thought, to change this script. When Jesus is telling you, that's impossible. It's the past, you know. You, why would you want to make a better past? <laughs> why don't you just release it? <laughs> release the past. Why, why wouldn't you release the past and be eternally happy? <coughs> why would you want to continue to try to keep tinkering with the, the miracle of manifesting and, and just... Now, admittedly, it, it can be very powerful, so I don't ever deny the value of manifesting, but it's one of those stepping stone ideas that shows you how powerful your mind is. A cloud busting where you lay there and you look at the clouds and you, you know you do the cloud busting and everything but that's that's not going to bring eternal happiness that's just going to start to help you see how powerful the mind is yeah, I don't think it was more like what would I how would I change it to manifest is more waking up yeah. like is it already in the script how many lifetimes I'll have before I wake up because it's already been in the past but yet it's not real yeah, it's all set. There's one workbook lesson where basically, it's basically, the, the time is set. And, and then when you read that, it's almost like, okay, you're saying I, I can't do anything to, to, you know, when he puts that set part in there, it's like, yeah, pulls you out, yeah then it's like, pulls you out of the whole thing. It's like, I can't, I can't control anything. Yeah, right. That's it. What, should I not work anymore? Should I not, should I need to do nothing? So that's, that starts to take you to the, remember the 12 steps of serenity prayer? What you can change, your mind. What you can't change, the script. <laughs> and the wisdom to know the difference. 
the Holy Spirit. You see, that's the serenity prayer. But if we look at what that means, what does it mean to change your mind? It simply means, initially, to give it a new purpose. And that's why it's so much fun. Because when I started to realize I could change the purpose for this world, then I started to see everything lighting up. Because I'm, I'm showing up to give, I'm not showing up to get anything from anybody. You know, I, I did a, a gathering one time, I was down in, I think, I was down in Caracas, Venezuela, and I was at this, doing like a, an all day gathering, and then we went for lunch, and they went out, and then in the afternoon I finished up the gathering about five o'clock, and then I noticed as we were getting close to the end of the gathering that there was a, a woman, she looked like maybe she was like in her 20s or 30, she was just crying and sobbing and crying and crying. And I sensed it was kind of a deep sorrow at, right at the end of, of the gathering. And so I, I said, please, just share whatever's on your heart. And she just said, my mother set this whole gathering up and you came here from Merida in the mountains to do this and we've spent the whole day together and my mother said which people made donations to help out with flights and different things and, and she, the mother gave the daughter all the money that all the people had contributed and she had it and during lunch she put it in her purse and then she went to Wendy's and she left the purse on the, ch on the chair when she went into the banyo, to the restroom, when she came out, the purse was gone. So I'm there, completing the workshop, and she's just like crying and crying. She said, I, 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 I can hardly speak this, but it was speaking the private thought. Like, I, I, I feel so terrible. I feel so stupid. I feel like I've made a terrible, terrible mistake because the, the proceeds for you to even go from here are all gone because of my stupid mistake in the, in the Wendy's restaurant. And then that's how the gathering I said, I said, no, it was all for this moment of perfect innocence. You are perfectly innocent and you did not do anything wrong. And we just zoomed in, like Jesus saying to the women at the well, you know, and I condemn you not, you know. Just seeing the absolute perfection of everything that occurs and seeing perfect innocence, that is the point of everything. There really is no other point than divine innocence, than to always offer the blessing. To not be a fault finder, to not try to correct error as if you can see it in form, but to be a fountain of innocence, of pure innocence. I condemn you not. You, I see your perfect Christ self. You, and then the woman could, could feel the joy start to come back. And then it could be a big hug, and all of us hugging. And then as I was leaving, the, the owner of the place and everything, they, they said, well, we're so, we, we have, obviously we have no money to give you, no pesos or anything. They said, take this Jesus off the wall. They took Jesus, <laughs> a big thing of Jesus, and it was a Spanish inscription. You always have a friend in Jesus. And they said, here take this, and I'm like, okay, I don't know how this is going to work on the plane, and so they bubble wrapped it, they bubble wrapped Jesus, and they got this, now I've got my luggage, no money, and now this big bubble wrap, I'm traveling with Jesus now, and I'm like, so I get to the airport, they drop me off, I go in there, I think, I'm going to have a cup of coffee, so I go, there's two chairs and a table, I, I said Jesus, <laughs> the bubble wrap, and I'm sitting there, and the waiter comes, and he's like, brings me the coffee, and he looks over. You can still see these South America, they know Jesus, covered in bubble wrap. And the waiter came and went. <laughs> and I thought, this is precious. It's all precious. But you have this sense of joy, of lightness and innocence, that it's all going perfect. That everything in your perceived life has always been perfect. You just didn't see it. Jesus was always there saying, I'm right here. It's wonderful. Even in what the ego says are the worst scenes, you know, those breakup scenes, those, you know, oh, the soulmates, no, it can't happen. Jesus is, yeah, yeah, this is a script. I've been telling you. <laughs> it's, it's just a script. Don't, don't be too concerned about 
anything of the world. Joy and peace I offer you. God's joy and peace yeah. will mine to give. Yes. If you, for me, if you hold that in your heart and you have the faith that it's written and you just show up and you, you your intention, you set your intention to offer joy and peace. And, and when you feel like you don't have it and you're just like, well, I want to be happy and I feel like crap today. How many of you have gone out and made somebody else happy and then you get happy, right? Have you ever tried that? I mean, if you want to be happy, make happy, right? So it's a joy and peace I offer you. And when you don't feel like you have it, you ask the Holy Spirit to give, to help you to, to do it. And it does. It turns yeah. it around, right? Yeah. And it doesn't make sense. But it does make sense. <laughs> it works. It works. Does anybody ever remember Carol King? Yes. Yeah. She had a song... You've got to get up every morning with a smile on your face and show the world all the love in your heart. Then people are going to treat you better. You're going to find, yes you will, that you're beautiful as you feel. You know, it's a be- there's so many great songs that are really just the Spirit pouring through just to share that joy and that beauty. I thought I saw a hand. There it is. Okay, I have a question that came up um, yesterday when we were doing the, the releasing. Diets. <laughs> okay, so my question is, I, being Mexican, grew up in a very Catholic family. You know, my aunts are very, you know, in church every Sunday. I was always on uh, every Sunday in church. And so I don't know how to be honest about being a student in Course of Miracles, right? Because I'm the first time that I was telling people, that, oh, yeah, I'm going to this course, and, and like, you have to be careful. Is that a cult? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you get into all this, and you know, it's been four or five years that I've been in this. So it's like you're really into this, right? So, so for example, coming here, that I'm, you know, family because of uh, Labor Day, like we're gonna do this something, and you wanna come, and like, no, I have an engagement. <laughs> so um, I was telling her. I'm kind of tired of being uncomfortable, of not being able to say it, or, and, I, and I don't want to say it because I don't want to hear again that story, right? Like, eh, you know. So you were talking about how your family, you know, and when your mom and all that stuff. So how do you deal with that? Or, or I was just thinking when you travel, what do you say? I'm a teacher of Course of Miracles, or, or how, how does that work? It sounds like the, we were talking about the true empathy. Mm-hmm. You want to share about the true empathy? Because really that's one of the, the most difficult um, Because when ideas. she was saying that her mom said, I was reading, and he, you know, they were just teaching this, and, and so like, you know, yeah. <laughs> you're yeah. just hearing this, you know, you're not hearing the whole thing. Right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, the, yeah, y- yesterday's exercise was just a... a attempt to tap into this true empathy because the, the, the temptation to join in stories and in suffering and in victimhood is enormous, you know, cause, because the stories and the personality self want to relate because we all want to, to relate and connect and that's the only way we know how to connect. And I think with families, it's very, um, I find it is the last step for me, because it, it took the longest time, and, you know, I can do it with... The with group from Tijuana, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> now we're talking, girl. No one knows for years. We all know for years. Incognito. We went to the stores. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was the same, like, uh, coming from a background, but I think it is a, it is a universal, these family concepts, and I, when I started this whole journey. I, I just finished an MBA. I was um, in the finance world, uh, you know, was very successful. And then I, I heard a voice from the sky basically told me to wait in Australia for the next thing to happen. That was to meet David. And so I did. And then, then it came the course and my mom would ask me what what is this decision? And I, I heard a voice, and that's completely from the left field. There's no reason I could justify or to convince, except to say the truth. Over and over again, this, this journey just taught me you have to be saying the truth and face all the guilt and all the, sa- the shame 
and all the, you know, the abandonment thoughts. My mom was the one, you know, talking about thinking this is a cult. Who is gonna look after you? You're gonna be end up on the streets if you don't work, and over and over again. But then in the end, it was my own fear and my own guilt because I didn't know how the future would be when I. I wrapped up my own business and left Australia to do this work. She thought, "Let me check you in into the facility and mental institution because <laughs> what do you think would happen? What if you get sick? What if you get older? Who would not look after you? Where would you're insane? This is total insanity." And then later on, a few years later, she said, "What is your? Because I got a visa in the United States." She said, "What is? How can the government give you a visa? What is your job title?" I said, "Minister." She just burst into laughter. <laughs> it was the opposite of the Catholic culture, the atheist thinking you completely gone wild in your mind. You're from you Beijing believe, are now a minister in the United States. You believe in God. <laughs> so it was like, but but for me, it was. If I if I have to really tap into my own honesty and over and over and over, and somehow gradually it, it it happened over a long period of time, she started to turn around. The reflection started to turn around, but it was over a long period of uncompromising, and she can see through examples. I can never convince her in words, never. So I stopped. And then she just watch, watch, and watch. And the last time it was ten years later. I I went back, and she's like, "Your life is really good. Can you bring your sister along with you?" <laughs> 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 it was a total turnaround, but they it was. They have to see it, and then that's what I also learned in this. David consistently, you know, was saying, "Teaching is demonstrating. Teaching is through attitude." You can never convince anybody who do not give you invitations.、Um, there is never through words. Words doesn't deliver anything if it is not backed with attitude. So in the end, is is like what Jesus says in lesson one fifty four. You are a messenger of God, but the message is for you and for you only. And you can only deliver the message when you receive it. So that's that's been. That's been how I deal with the the family to to show up with the attitude of the the reward that we receive.、Yeah. And I think too that the parables, like Francis's parables, can help you because you can feel like you know sometimes the projections and the doubts and the witnesses coming strong. So Francis gave up. Her, let's go over husband, two houses, her own, owning your own business, finance. And, and country, two countries. You let one country go, okay. Australia, no, let another country go. She's like throwing these things off like, like they're just concepts. And、oh, I must be about my father's business. I must find my true union with God. I can flip these roles and concepts off. When it came to family, that was pretty strong. But maybe you can tell. The, to me, this is one of the greatest parables of all time. In fact, we. We told this parable to Judy Sketch, who's one of the original four with the course, and Judy was like, "That's such a good story. You need to write that down. You need to put that in a book." But we call it the parable of the three priests, because <laughs> because she got divorced from her husband, which you can imagine in your culture, you know, that's a big thing. It's a big family decision. That's a big family decision. It's a major decision, a divorce, and then to go on a path like a course in miracles. From to the family's perspective, that are atheists. That's just like a cult. Yeah, yeah that's、oh, totally. the worst so, kind. So this, I mean, to, to actually go into religion would would have been just as bad as as that. <laughs> and they said, okay, if you if you believe in God and this course, we're gonna bring ministers、priest. to talk priests to talk to you. <laughs> so they found the first priest, and I. I went to talk, and I was very beginning. I I haven't met. I mean, I just met David for the first time, and I was so inspired, you know. So I went to talk to the priest and talk about love, and and it was an okay experience. We had a, a pretty cordial conversation, 
And then they, my mom and my ex-husband thought it didn't work, so they brought the second priest. <laughs> <laughs> so the second priest, I went in. I thought, okay, I can, I can talk this. I can convince the priest. I went in, and he was so sharp. He was talking about the devil. He was talking about. I had no idea how to, and I I went down and down and down and down, and I in the end I just. Cried and sobbed, and I because I could not convince him or myself anymore with words. The, with my limited knowledge of God and and the course, there there was things that I just never could. So I left that. I was so like sad and and broken from inside, and I didn't know I could continue to to do this anymore. And my ex husband. Was in the car with me. He drove me over, so he was gonna drive me out. And he was like, pretty happy that I was. <laughs> but then, an exorcism, huh? an exorcism. <laughs> yeah, shattered. Of course, a miracle student shattered by priests. Yeah, <laughs> and then so, so I was, I, I was, I said to him because I said to him I wanted to come to the community in Utah, and that's. That's right before that point. So in the car, I was crying, breaking down. I said, "I, okay, okay, then I give up. I wouldn't go." And suddenly, I saw in his eyes this disappointment that was completely different than the surface mask of, you know, there's something that I saw that was unified. We have the same. Desire to wake up, and I that shocked me that 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 seeing, and so I I said I wouldn't go, and then I saw his eyes reflecting back something else, so that gave me hope. So I thought, okay, I'm he's with me. Actually, he's with me, even though he doesn't admit it. I see something deeper. So then, so I. I came and I was in the community for a few years already. And then one day, my mom came to the states from China all the way. She said, "Can we meet up in San Francisco just for a few days?" So I said, "Sure, sure." So we 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 spent a few days in the hotel there and did some sightseeing. And then one morning, I I came out of the shower and there was a guy sitting in the Living room,、oh, no. and that's the third priest that my mom and my ex-husband <laughs> found. And this time, they found this guy from California. He apparently was a devoted Course in Miracles teacher and student. Was a first generation. He got the course in the seventies, and he had had been teaching for a decade of the course. And then he, something happened. So he went completely 180 degree. He became this course in miracle. What do you call deprogrammer? Deprogrammer. <laughs> so he he help he go to the church talk about how this is devil evil work, and he wrote books and he held workshops and just for that purpose. So he came. To tell me, this is what she means as she comes out of the shower <laughs> to see her mother in a, in a hotel in San Francisco. How did your mother find someone like that? That's amazing. My my ex husband. Ex husband. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't、like, gonna give up. We need to save her. Yeah, and he was very like you know, I was on the same boat, the course, and then but the devil is real. The devil. Let me tell you about the devil. So he was very sincere. He just talk and talk. And I, I was already very convinced by my own experience. So I just keep. I had this laughing bug. I don't know. Like I just keep laughing, and 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 he couldn't finish his sentence, and he was laughing with me. And every time he tried to finish something, in the end, we just laughed so hard, couldn't couldn't talk anymore. And then my mom came to the living room, like this is a total. Failure, because 
fired this again. Guy just... You were supposed to be crushed for good <laughs> that time with the deprogramming. You were laughing. We were laughing so hard about nothing. Just like he got so serious and we laughed. And so in the end, he just gave up. He just said, can I, can I have lunch with you? <laughs> and and that's, that's how it ended. Yeah. That's a great yeah. book. Please write the book. No, seriously. Yeah, but seriously. Fantastic. Because in, okay, the, end, in the end, he now. wanted to have lunch, and she basically saying, well, I will go to lunch with you. We'll all go to lunch. Her, oh, yeah, that's right. Her, her mother, her ex, oh. and everybody will all go to lunch. One condition that we don't talk about any of this, like we don't just try to ourselves. convince or debate, no. but just to enjoy that's it. And then they went out and had a wonderful... Lunch together, you know. So that, that that's a great little parable. The three, the three priests, and the three priests. Uh, you can, <laughs> that can give you hope when you. you know, whenever it starts to get really intense, just think of the three priests and the and the the deprogrammer, Course in Miracles deprogrammer priest, I mean, uh, and Francis. Just when you think you've seen it all <laughs> and heard it all, you hear the parable of the three priests, and it's like, oh my gosh. But the laughter, you know, can you imagine the devil's real, the devil, the devil, and then bursting into laughter, and then br- and laughing, it's contagious, then he starts laughing. The de- deprogrammer was out of a job uh, at that moment, you know, the world will end in laughter. <laughs> I miss something like you, because I was going to, to divorce, but at first I said, one year I'm going to be separated, nobody's going to know in my house, because if I tell them, they won't, they were going to be my priest. To me. So I went, one year, nobody knows. Because I know one year, that I was very sure of my, my, my decision. So I did that. But my, my mm, kids went to school with legionarios de Cristo, have you ever heard about this? Yes. They used to be, mm-hmm. my, my sons went in the school, I, I worked with them, I made a lot of mm-hmm. things with them, mm-hmm. I was the person of the seed, a lot of things. And there was one moment when you say three priests, there had three priests in front of me, the three of them, and we were talking because somebody else was going to work there instead of me, but she was divorced, so she cannot work there, and I was like, I think your God and my God is very different. Mm-hmm. That's when I turned around and went out and said, this is not for me. I so said, how can you judge somebody because he's divorced? And the, I remember because there were three priests, priests in front of me. And I said, no, we're not looking at the same God. Yeah. Because God is love. Yeah. You, you cannot judge a person. And I did that same thing. And now, yeah, you know my twin sister. It was so difficult for her to bring her in this. Mm-hmm. My sister, we mm-hmm. have seven in the family. Mm-hmm. And now we're four in this one by one, I'm trying to take this. And yeah, my mom is like, what is happening? <laughs> because they're very Catholic. But yeah. they're, they're an the example. Like you said, this living, yeah. let's give example that it's really, this is love and joy. And instead of defending. Yeah. Instead yeah. of defending. Yeah. And, yeah. And, just, uh-huh. yeah. and the more these parables come in, like the three priest parable is helpful, it's, but... Since I've been around the world and done, accepted invitations, you know, Mexico, South America, I started accepting invitations in 2003. First went to Argentina, and but before I had, I had went to, and in, in later years, I remember when I was in Utah talking to my friend Suzanne. We were coming back from the monastery towards Salt Lake City. She was taking me to the plane, and uh, she said. Oh yeah, we did all kinds of retreats out here where the monastery is now. She was a retreat center, and she said we would do Course in Miracles retreats and this. And then she, we were having a a hamburger, and she was like saying, and and we we do women's retreats and we do men's retreats, and I just burst into laughter. I said, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard. You do women's retreats, and she said, yeah. And I said, and men's retreats. I said. Wow, all I ever do is enlightenment retreats. It's the idea of inviting just men or just women into an enlightenment retreat seemed like so funny to me uh, <laughs> because I thought, that's the strangest thing. I just show up and whoever shows up, shows up. So I go to South America, I go down, very Catholic, South America, Mexico, and 
I just do these enlightenment retreats. I do like 19 consecutive gatherings on 19 consecutive days in Buenos Aires and you know, 15 million, it was massive. And, I, and it was all orchestrated by Jesus. But I'd say at these gatherings, mostly Course in Miracles students came. I was about 97% women. I, didn't, I wasn't doing women's retreats or anything. I was just showing up to talk about God and love, but there was 97% women. Then I, I went to Colombia, it was around Colombia, Cali, and Bogota, and Cartagena, and uh, about 93% women. And uh, I was just like, hmm, interesting. And so, but then when I would go to the rural areas in South America, I would mostly, again, women, women with children sometimes would come. They were just drawn, drawn, drawn to the Course in Miracles, to the Enlightenment teachings and everything. And I thought, well, this is just a vibrational thing. It has really nothing to do with gender, ultimately. It's just the readiness. It's the readiness of the heart to open up, of the mind. It, that's, it's just being drawn. All we are doing is drawing forth witnesses to our state of mind. But also, when I would go to the rural areas, I would hear stories of, like in Colombia back then, you know, of, they said, oh, you're going to meet this woman, and her child's been kidnapped by the guerrillas, and... She's working the course lessons with a kidnapped child, you know, the, the same lessons, but with extreme conditions. Like when you look at things people go through in the States, this was like kidnapped child, these are like extreme things, and they were moving through things so fast, they didn't seem to value the materialistic things. A lot of them were already poor, they loved Jesus, they didn't buy the old Catholic hierarchies, and they're like, that's not the real Jesus, and this is not the real teachings. Zoom. Un curso de malagros. Zoom. Zoom. And they would go into this, and then it would go into it so deep that, that they said, we, we have difficulty talking to our boyfriends and husbands. Uh, they said, talk about a shortage of the dating and, and lifelong partners. They said, we want to talk about the, the miracles, we want to talk about these deep teachings, and they're not interested. Mm -hmm. They're macho men, and they're brown, <laughs> they're you know, macho, <laughs> and all this, and guns, and competition, and, blah, blah, blah. and they're like, I want God, I want God. If it, if it costs me my whole relationship, uh, if it co I'll change my dating, I'll change everything. And then I would hear stories as I'd be out in the rural areas of Colombia, and these people, the women were just witnessing to how devoted, that when they were really wanting to talk about the miracles and go deeper, it was women's groups that sprung up. And there really wasn't many guys around. And I said, see, there it is. But it's a witness to your heart's desire. But did it really it, surprise you? No, it didn't. It was didn't. women when you begin to receptiveness and openness is a feminine quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it didn't. And, and men it didn't. find that fearful. And yeah. so women are immediately drawn to it, and men it, are only it drawn is, to it when yeah. they start to touch their feminine It didn't side. surprise me at all. I mean, to me it all seemed very natural. It seemed very vibrational. Just yeah. like, very, ah, of course, of course. But then it was kind of interesting because because of the sexual stereotypes and because of the socio and economic status mm -hmm. down there where the men held the jobs, the men controlled, it was a very patriarchal system and everything, then I really started to see the miracles and the courage of these women. Mm -hmm. Because they would start to tell, they've been doing the course for years, mm -hmm. and they would do it and uh, they would say things to me like, well, when my husband comes home or my boyfriend partner comes <coughs> home, I just hide the book. Mm -hmm. I had that hide it, where'd you put it? I put it under the coffee table, under the, so I was like, hmm, fascinating that they were actually vibrationally opening up but hiding the course for, for fear of loss, fear of abandonment, fear of rejection, those kind of things. So we had good discussions about that. And then there was one woman who was like, had been in the course for years and, and her husband was not, her husband controlled all the money. Um, a lot of the women that were so devoted to the course didn't have a lot of education. They had no socioeconomic like standing to just leave and go get a job or, or have money, you know. So then I was starting to watch all those dynamics going on, and you could see the faith and courage. Where this one woman, she basically uh, 
decided she was going to keep going with the chorus deeper and deeper and deeper. And it literally, the family cleaved, where two of the children turned towards Mama and her vibration, and two turns toward Papa. And I remembered the Bible, Jesus saying, Father will be turned against son, and mother will be turned against daughter for my namesake. And there I was in Colombia going, wow, it's all a vibrational thing. It's not about keeping the family together. It's like we have to realize that we all just keep drawing forth witnesses to our state of mind. And that Jesus was a very good teacher of that, because I know in the Urantia book it describes that Jesus was there, the apostles are doing this big public gathering, and Mother Mary shows up in the back. And then the, through the ranks, it starts to pass up, your mother's here, your mother's here, your mother's here. But it's interesting because it's the Christ that is speaking. And here b comes up about mom, and then Jesus says, who is my father, mother, sister, brother? As he looks across the audience, and his finger goes around. He that does the will of our Father in Heaven is Father, Mother, Sister, Brother. It was a full-blown teaching of A Course in Miracles in a beautiful scene 2,000 years ago that all of these genetic, you know, people talk about genetics and family histories and everything, it's all made up by the ego. There are family trees and Mormons, you know, the history and, you know, and biological family, which seems to be in the, in the Hispanic culture, that's, that's like a rock. You know, I could go and speak about this and, and then loosen up from the self-concept. And they said, yeah, yeah, that's good with this and this and the church, but not the family. Not, that's like, <laughs> But so this, that's what's so beautiful about this teaching is we've had to take it. And as I've gone very deep, uh, I know Mary Magdala, there's a beautiful movie about Mary Magdala where she has so much pressure from her father, her brother is violently angry, and Jesus comes along, and she looks at the family, and she looks at Jesus, and <laughs> I'm going that away. <laughs> like, it was such a strong calling that she literally was almost this ostracized, Mary Magdalene was, because of her calling. And that's not uncommon. And so, I mean, I feel like what you're sharing, too, is that that's why it's so difficult, because of the, the cultural conditioning Culture. well, yes. for you to really stay with this and hang in with this, where the conditioning is just saying, what are you doing? Guilt, shame, you're bringing, that's what they were telling Mary Magdalene, you bring shame upon our family if you go with him. And it's not only him, that guy with long hair over there, but they're all men. <laughs> what, what are we going to, you're just going off and leaving your family and leaving an opportunity to be a wife, a childbearing mother for some guy with long hair and a bunch of other guys. Like, what are you doing? You know, you're, you're going to be ostracized wherever you go. Uh, and she did have to face that, you know, and now you're facing that here right now. in 2,000 years and it's the same, the same lesson. So we don't want, like to defend this, we just say, oh, we're going to go watch a movie. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all we say. So you're the four sisters? No, no for no, free. No, no. I do tell the truth well, to myself. Well, we're sisters. <laughs> 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 well, I have one comment, because most of what you're talking about is having courage and honesty. Uh -huh. yeah. But I always think of that saying from Jesus about throwing your pearls before swine. And that's why I usually, yeah, come up with a story. But, uh, but then maybe that's just the fear. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a certain amount of wisdom in the sense that, that like you were sharing, uh, I don't ever try to convince anybody of anything. Um, even when I had students, even when I had people start to show up in the 1990s, say, you are my teacher, I'm your student, um, I would... I would basically wait for them to invite me to join with them about the thoughts in their mind even. I wouldn't even presume, just because they were saying that, that there was any in invitation for me to do that. I would wait for them to kind of come up to me and say, listen, you know, I'm really working through some pretty heavy duty stuff. If you see anything, would you please point it out? I would be so detached that I would wait for the invitation. 
And that's why Jesus has a section in the Course called the Correction of Error where he says, do not correct your brother. Mm -hmm. Do not confound him. So this is where true empathy comes in, where you have to come so strong into the awareness of the light in your mind that once you do, you have no desire to try to convince anybody of anything, to try to change anybody's mind, because Jesus is basically teaching we're all one mind. So when you change your mind, all minds are changed mm -hmm. by your mind changing, because there's only one of us. You don't have to go out and try to recruit people, change people, <coughs> tell people that they're doing wrong. You don't have to point out errors. Jesus doesn't even want us to point out errors. So in many cases, I found there's this just beautiful silent presence. But also, little by little, I, like I remember with my biological mother, she was very much into planning and having everything planned and set. So she wanted to know, like, okay, this weekend we got a family reunion, or we're going to do this or that. Um, are you going to be there? We'd, I really love you to be there. And I had to really learn to pray and interact with her in a way that Jesus would come through me. Because I would say, hmm, thank you for asking, and I'll just, I'm just taking it a day at a time. And I'll just, I'll see what I'm guided to do on Saturday. And she would just look at me like, Who is this? This is your mother speaking to you. I'm saying, we're, we're, I'm inviting you to something on Saturday. And you're saying, Thank you so much. It was always, Thank you so much. It always started with a gratitude. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I really will just have to see. And then it took some time of me just, because I was living in the moment. I wasn't making exceptions with mom, I wasn't making exceptions with family. And then I got so into purpose that I started traveling around the United States, sharing these ideas, traveling around the world, sharing these ideas, just flowing in the spirit, in the love, and the trust. And then there was one point when I came back to Cincinnati and uh, my sister, actually her, her first two names are the, Jesus' parents, Mary, Joe, Mary and Joseph. <laughs> Uh, and John was the name of the, fa the biological father, and Evelyn, Eve. <laughs> and I was named after King David in the Bible, <laughs> the king of the Jews. It's like, hmm. And my last name I found out when I was 40 years old in German meant, meant Master of Hope. I'm like, really? Fascinating, all wow. discovering all these kind of symbols. But I do remember going back home, and my, my sister Mary Jo, she said, oh, we have one of her children was having a birthday party, you want to come out to this place for a birthday party, and a friend had just come into town who was into the course for many years, and he was very extroverted and everything, a big smile on his face, but he had changed his name from Howard Carpenter to Love, Joy, Divine. <laughs> and uh, it's fine with me. People can choose any name that they want. So we go. I said it was a, a hamburger place called Fuddruckers. So I said, oh, "Come on, uh, love, joy, divine. You want to come with me to meet my my, my family?" And uh, it's a birthday party, and he's like, "Yes, it's all wonderful, so much joy and happiness." And so I remember going in there and. I, hug my niece and my little nephews and then my, my sister comes up and she's aware of what I'm doing. She's, she would always be asked by, ex, by friends and people that knew me many, many years ago, whatever happened to David? He just, where did he go? He just disappeared. And she's, he's like Marion Williamson. That was her. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> so anyway, I go in there and we're hugging and hugging and then here comes Mary Jo around. And, and I could see Love, Joy, Divine's eyes are all lit up. And he runs up, he runs up to like give her a hug, and she's, <laughs> she's not necessarily, and she just looks at him and she sticks her hand out and everything, and she says, uh, he says, hi there. I love Joy Divine. <laughs> now, the thing about it is, if you're going to do this kind of stuff, you don't have to announce this stuff. Like, you know, this is like, I'm here at a birthday party. Hi, my name is Love Joy Divine. And she just smiled and looked. She said, 
I'm the biological sister. <laughs> <laughs> and I was sitting there, this is surreal. <laughs> but, but she had probably listened and come to some of, and heard the parables of, in the parables, she's the biological, I'm the, bi- the biological, I'm, hi, I'm Love, Joy, Divine, I'm the biological <laughs> sister, and I'm just, <laughs> but you start to feel so expansive and relaxed because you start to realize that just, these are the characters, and you don't have to control anything, and it's more just starting to feel more relaxed and more confident and letting Jesus choose your words. So initially, like I've had experiences where, like I went to my grandmother's funeral, I was very close with her, Lillian, and she died when she was 99. So I was at the funeral and, and then a lot of people were there and everything like this, and then um, then, as I'm at the funeral, I'm at my grandmother's funeral, she starts talking to me in my mind. You know, some people nowadays like to leave like video things and this and that. Now she wants to do a live performance at her own funeral. <laughs> and I'm just like, okay. It's like, so, so then I'm there at a funeral and then here comes Lillian through me, and she, she is so <coughs> loving. She's always been so loving. She was so never had a, a <coughs> never graduated from high school, but had the most loving heart and was so loving. And so I'm just letting her speak through the body of David at her own funeral, and people just started crying, and they knew it was her too, <coughs> even even in that context. And they just started crying and crying and crying. And then we went from the the funeral parlor, we went out to the cemetery, and then she, she was so giving that they brought all these flowers to put on the grave, and she came again, and she's like, no, take them, take them with you, in remembrance, you know, it was, don't leave them on the grass here, it was just, the, and again, people felt so much love, so, so I've had to really let go of, of thinking I could judge anything about anything. Uh, even in those kind of situations. But it started with me just relaxing, and many times there was just nothing to say. But I did start to kind of get out of the habit of, of trying to make up an excuse, or feeling I needed to explain everything. You know, like there's so much, and you can't, like the thing about trying to please everyone, or you just have to just come back into that presence. And and that's that just grows stronger and stronger, and then that that experience is what really is, is, is who you are. It just gets stronger and stronger. Yes? My son and I uh, go round and round on the cashew. And there's a lot of passion behind it. We can finally felt led to say, let's just agree to disagree. And, and it just kind of broke something. And we realized what a dance of the ego was We both realized I wasn't going to change his mind. He wasn't going to change mine. And what does it matter? You know, we're one mind. And now, it's, uh, we talk about all kinds of things, and then every now and then it'll creep in, and then we'll say, okay, we agree to disagree. Mm-hmm. And it just sounds so simple, but it's been so helpful. And what a wonderful lesson it was for us. It's beautiful. You so much lighter afterwards. You don't have to control, convince. That's the setting the goal section where Jesus says, if you put the goal of truth and you put peace out in front, then you will perceive everything and everyone as contributing to that goal. But from the ego training, we're used to, he says, if, if you don't have a clear-cut goal out in front, then whatever happens will just seem to happen and you'll look back on it and you'll start to judge what you like about what happened and what you didn't like. And so he's saying the only way that you can stay in this unity, in this unified, is really have your purpose out front. And that that takes a lot of practice because we're so used to breaking the world into all these categories and situations. I'm going to visit my mom. I'm going to the grocery store. I'm going to the auto mechanics. I'm going to a funeral, I'm going to a wedding. You see, we have these different situations and then we believe we wear different masks 
around different people and show up in different situations. And that's part of the fragmented perception of the ego. It's divided, really, what's one, just one script, into many different parts. And so that's, that's truly the way out of people-pleasing, when you really become really self-honest about the love and the peace and the harmony being very important, then it's like you bring that with you, and then you start to unify your perception of the world. You don't start to see it in different lights, in different situations. And one time uh, somebody asked me, so the problem is in the thinking. I said, yeah, it's, I call it situational thinking. It's a, it's a terrible addiction of thinking in terms of situations. <laughs> you know, because we act and react differently, depend on our interpretation of these seemingly separate situations. But what if there was this beautiful thread of light that came through all the situations of this world, and this was the light of our being, the light of truth. And what if that was like the thread of connector? Because one time Jesus was with Helen Schuckman, and, and they were kind of talking about things, and they were together, and, and then Jesus said, well, I'll show you time. And when they were flying by, First he took her in it, what it looked like, a bunch of different segments, just like you might picture time. And then he said, come over here though, let's look at another angle. And Jesus flew her around, and it wasn't actually separate segments, it was a spiral. Time was a spiral instead of just broken pieces. And then Jesus said, come here with me, and they, her and he and Helen Shuckman flew really close to the spiral. And then he took her right into the angle along the spiral and he showed her the line of connectivity that actually everything was continuous and there was no break whatsoever. That time was just invented and then shown from an angle where it seems to be that you're, you're trapped in it or that it's just a series of moments, a series of days, a series of years. But he was visually showing her the connectivity that runs through what seems to be linear time. That really it's only one instant. But with, from a different angle it looks like millions of years. And it's really just one instant. Fabulous. Yeah, it's, it's amazing all the things we're shown, just to, to help us realize. We just need to change our perspective. It's not really changing anything in form, it's really just changed the perception. I have one question about uh, prayers, because um, you always say um, we're doing prayers and we're praying and we pray. Are you praying all together in one form, or do you have like a prayer which is? I mean, like, as Christians, we go to church. We have a, like a formula. We pray and we glorifying God, and we we are happy. We are like using singing as being involved with happiness and expressing it. So, uh, what do you use as a prayer? Are you only praying for yourself? Or are you sitting together? Because I never see you guys like chanting or praying. Or, or, so, or is this a prayer for you just in your heart? Or <laughs> how you, you work the prayers? I think with a lot of our decision making and, and a lot of things, it's like we go into silence. So it's, it's, it's a little more like the Eastern um, thoughts of meditation, which is more of just a, a stillness and a receptivity, mm. as opposed to words, um, yes. praying with words. Um, and in, Jesus basically gave <coughs> Helen Schuckman a, a booklet that's now part of the, the course. It's been incorporated, but it was called The Song of Prayer, where mm there were all these questions that Ken Wapnick had around prayer. He said to Helen, ask Jesus, and then he dictated a whole booklet called The Song of Prayer, which is extremely helpful in, I could do like a week-long a week -long retreat on this, on this little pamphlet, because there's so many nuances. But basically what he's saying in there is that your prayer is your desire. Mary Baker Eddy said the same thing in her writings. So your prayer is your desire. And if your desire is splintered for many things, then, then that's the ego. You know, wanting 
a lot of things. And when you pray for specifics, you're really, you're, it's still not realizing the script is written, so you're still praying for outcomes. Like, protect Uncle Joe on his travels. May he have a safe journey. Or, please help Aunt Edna with her cancer diagnosis, and, and so on and so forth. So Jesus describes prayer as a ladder where you can't help but praying from the level of awareness that you are. So to the extent that you believe in specifics, which is, is a world of specifics, in order for the prayer to be relevant, then you can't help but pray for specifics. What we're describing is like with Francis Romero in, in the movie and, and bringing in Jen, you're asking about our community, it's just, just we all come together and there can be speaking, but it's more just prayerfully sharing something that is coming to mind. Uh, maybe around the kitchen, like there's tension, starts off with, well, there's tension in the kitchen. It's really tense in there. Oh, anybody have any ideas about that? Well, Frances is overwhelmed. Uh, she has a, somebody says she has a, a sore leg, this and this. She, there's, it's overwhelmed. There's too many meals. Um, three meals a day, um, and she's kind of running the kitchen, but she's, she's totally overwhelmed. And so it starts with a perceived problem, and then it goes into this prayerful inner listening. What would you have me do? What would you have me say? Show me the way. Show me what would be helpful. And then we go into that prayerful silence, and then we start to hear some things. Ah, I think Francis needs help. Francis Romero needs help. Who do we have that could help? I'm, was Jen at the mystery school? Maybe she was over at Camus. Was Camus she was at Camus. Camus. Yeah. yeah. So it was like, oh, well, she's over there. And then she came into mind, bringing her in. And then that wrinkle about her leading the kitchen, that was another wrinkle that was given through just prayerful inner listening. So what Jesus says in the Song of Prayer is that if two people pray together, genuinely, sincerely, and deeply, because there's only one Holy Spirit, they will hear the same thing. And, and if they're really attuned, they will hear the same thing at the same time. Mm -hmm. Right? There's not seven billion Holy Spirits. Well, my Holy Spirit's telling me we should get divorced. <laughs> my Holy Spirit's telling me we should stay together. My Holy Spirit is telling me tacos tonight. My Holy Spirit now says steak. <laughs> you know, stay home. No, we're going out to eat. You know, this is a great. This is like really intellectualizing and trying to split the Holy Spirit up into seven hundred billion different fragments. You know, when you really pray, then you hear the same thing. And and how supportive that is when you're praying together as a group and you you're looking around and the heads are nodding. Because people used to say, how do you live in spiritual community? What's your, what's your decision-making structure? <laughs> you know, because like, it would be like a country, you know. Is it a democracy? <laughs> Is it a, a dictatorship? Is it a beneficent dictatorship? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what is your structure? I would say, well, we, we pray, we listen, we listen. People share feelings, share ideas. But like with Judy Scutch telling us, they they may have their flare-ups and disagreements, but when they really tune in to pray, they hear the same thing. When we don't hear the same thing, let's say you have 12 people there, they're praying, and 11 people are saying this, and then one goes, no, nope. no, <laughs> no, no way. Instead of being like, hush, hush, you know, go along with the other 11, we're like, tell us more, because we're fascinated. Look, a dissenting voice. You know, we're because we know that the presence of love is so strong, and the presence of love is for all of us. So we actually welcome. Tell us about it. Why do you feel that way? What are your thoughts? You see, it's it's all kind of moving into that inner listening. Show us the way. Lead us. Guide us with everything. Not in a kind of ritualistic way where we we can't have a drink. What oh, what should we pray? Should I open this or not? You know. Jesus tells us not to become obsessed with every little detail, but the more we get into the practice of devotional listening, that 
everything that we need to know will, will be provided for us. So Jesus describes prayer as a, song, as a ladder where you can't help but pray the level where your consciousness is at. You have to receive, if you believe in specifics, you will receive specific guidance if that's helpful to you. And oftentimes we do. We receive very specific guidance and it's very, very helpful. But as you go up that ladder, you start to approach the top of the ladder and you start to realize what Jesus says is the highest prayer that you can offer. The prayer that, that will take you back into heaven, back into creation. And the prayer of, at the top of the ladder is, Father, what is your will for me? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's really a total surrendering to know God's will. It's not a, at, that, at that level, it's not for specifics at all. It's for, you're praying for a connection and experience of direct union with God. And all of the other prayers uh, on the way up the ladder are part of undoing the ego. That's what we call guidance. That's why there, there are the specifics. So, in one sense, our community is, you know, I know they say sometimes the family that prays together stays together, and, and for us, you know, guidance is, is not a frivolous thing. Uh, when people say, can you even be guided, you know, that's really the prayer that we have, is to be to guided, to be shown with the decisions that we make including in the mystery school where everybody, was it 20 showed up plus 10 from the film team and then, so there's like 30, 30 some people there for that month and or the film team was longer than a month, mm -hmm. we were there 10 days, before. 10 days before. So that's just the way we live our life and then the movie is just like a, a reflection of, of how we live our life really, it's just a, like a little snapshot. <coughs> Great question, though. Your prayer is your desire, so if, if I, my prayer is my desire, that means, let thine eye be single. It's the blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. You know, it's like purity. That's what a beautiful prayer that is, for purify, purify my mind, purify my soul, that I may know my true nature and may, I may know God. So that's really what's underneath it. And if you think it's all one mind too, if you, if you have a prayer for a Snickers bar, then the whole universe has a prayer for the Snickers bar. Because there's only one of us. It takes it away from that individual sense of your prayer, his prayer, her prayer, more to that sense of if prayer is desire, then if I need to watch <coughs> what I'm desiring. <laughs> am I desiring idols or am I desiring you know, healing and forgiveness? Well, it seemed like Jesus was very willing or encouraging um, Helen in the minutia of her life. What cab to take at what time. Yes. Where to get her for a coat. Which, all these things were not just isolated incidents either. No. They had a lot of meaning to them. The cab driver, the particular cab driver had a message to hear or provide. Yeah, yes. it's actually, I honestly, that's the way these last thirty years have gone in my life. Because with with all the travel, it's like where to go, who to see, what means of transportation. We even timing around um, flights, bus routes, train routes. You know, New York City, where Helen was, it was a lot of a lot of decisions. It's a big metropolitan area. Uh, you, he, uh, one day where he went through her day, he said you could have offered so-and-so a cab ride because he was going in the same direction. You know, to me, I have not pushed away the specifics because I feel like if my mind's asleep and I'm being guided by Jesus, then I, there's going to be a lot of specific guidance. Mm -hmm. And that was leaving academia behind. That was um, at one point, Jesus guided me to a parking lot, or to, to a, a, an automobile dealership, and I'm like, what's this? And I, I only have so many money. He said, yeah, you're going to buy a car. That's the car. That little tiny gold, yes, that's the one. Okay, 
where, what are we going to do with the car? Well, pack it up, you're going to be traveling, road trip. Where? West. Drive west. Drive west? To what city? West. You know, it's like, I will take you, we're in a moment by moment, listen and follow relationship. You're the follower, <laughs> and I'm the leader. <laughs> and this is the way, I'm going to give you a lot of specific guidance. It was just like with Helen, it wasn't like, I am with you always, even to the end of time. You know, those kind of things. And that was like, turn left. I remember I was in the car one time, and I'm sitting at a red light. <coughs> and Jesus is like, turn left. I'm like, I'm not turning left. I, I'm going to the grocery store to pick up some a few things, and the grocery store is right there. Turn left. I'm going to get the groceries. I'm getting the groceries. Turn left. <laughs> so, I did not turn left. The light turned green. I went ahead and I hit the biggest pothole. <laughs> and it just ruined the tire on the car. And then as I'm looking at the tire ripped off the wheel and everything, oh, turn left. You know, you see it was just the authority issue of just like, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to pick up a few groceries. The grocery store is right there. It's not left. You see, that's where the authority issue comes where we don't know what things are for, we don't know what things mean, but this is a, a curriculum in listen and follow. <coughs> and to the extent that we're willing to listen and follow, it's joyful. And to the extent we buck and we say, oh no, no, not, not today. <laughs> then, and we've all had those experiences where we even, we, we, we go through the day and something starts to bother us and then that little hint of, of what we call a minor issue starts to blow up into something big. Because we would rather be right than happy, and we're going to follow it and ride this thing out, and we're so determined that we're going to be right about this. And then at some point, hopefully it dawns on us, would you rather be right or happy? That's what the rules for decision are helpful in the course, because it helps us start to go and actually have a happy day by having a trusting, intuitive <coughs> following day is where our happiness comes from, not trying to, I know best based on my past learning. And also that comes up in relationships where we have some kind of outcome in mind and then we scream and we kick and we grieve and we mourn and everything like this and, and then at some point we let go of trying to control things, and then, oh, back to peace. Oh. oh it was there the whole time. It was there the whole time. Like, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm not in charge, but there is one who is in charge, yeah. Wow. Everything goes by the blink of an eye. We <laughs> just go, go, go. <laughs> Two minutes, you want to wrap it up? Do you have anything to say or you want to have anybody else have enough? Can go to Tijuana. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Tomorrow. I just have a quick question. Going back to the script is written, um, does that mean that it's already written when we would lay down this body? More than it's everything, including the laying down the body, including accepting the atonement and and the wake up, the last scene before the flesh, <laughs> flesh of light, everything is, um, is scripted, yeah, so. So no worries. Yeah, that's right, you really can, you can just really relax and. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, so, yeah. thank you thank so you. much thank for you. sharing this with us. We are so honored to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is trying out the, with the movie and showing it to, to different groups. We've yeah, it's, this is such a spontaneous trip. Thanks to all the, the ones that we're <coughs> collaborating with. We did a, a gathering in San Francisco within 48 hours. We, we, heard the, the prompt and then 48 hours later it happened and we had 
30, 40 people there, and it was just like, it happens very, very swift. So just feel like an honor to join all of you in this very fast and spontaneous, joyful journey. And we probably will come back next year in the spring. Oh, yay. So, yeah. 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 Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I feel so grateful for you guys showing up and I'm so joyful that this experience is universal. You know, what, what, whatever shows up here in the movie, there, there's just one experience and one mind moving toward, toward the opening up and toward healing. I feel very grateful to have this knowing that we're in this together. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Are those your cows? <laughs> <laughs> the cows that were in the movie? Yeah. Neighbors. Neighbors. Uh, neighbors. <laughs> they, just, they just roam. We don't put a fence up, so they, um, they join us at times and make some moves, mm-hmm. some sounds. For us. Yeah, we also have an online retreat this weekend, which David will be presenting from Canvas from the studio I was talking about. On Friday, you can go to our livingmiracles.org website and see the events if you want to stay connected with us throughout the weekend. It's a Friday night session, then Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, we have a movie that you can watch with us right online. And I sit behind the computer so I can see all your smiling faces. Uh-huh. And Sunday closing. And Sunday closing session. Yeah. Yeah, and there's Spreaker. Spreaker, you can stay connected <laughs> yeah. while you drive. I'll be sending out, or one of the team will be sending out a link to all of the resources. Yeah. Okay. So you yeah. can get yeah. on the yeah. list, the community list. Yeah. And so that will go to <coughs> so if you're a guest. And we don't have your email address. I'll put a little bit of it. I'll write that down if you want to stay connected. Including a recording of the sessions from this week. So if you are trying to record it yourself, you don't need to. We'll make this available. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, it's already available. <laughs>